the Fed is going to be late. I think that the Fed is imposing a severe slowing on the economy. They'll pause if inflation is declining, but they won't be able to if they're not uh, achieving their inflation objectives. They're looking for slower inflation, but still nowhere near target. The Fed, as well as every other central bank in the world, got it wrong. They said, oh, transitory, transitory, transitory. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures up four tenths of one percent on the S and P. I know we do this every single Monday morning, but forgive me, TK. What a week coming up! What a week coming up, and it's inflation <laughs> repeat, report centered centered on it. But I want to go back to Friday, John, in our opening comments, folks. I wish you saw Big Little when we're getting ready, uh, particularly on a Monday, because we're talking about what happened over the weekend. I think the zeitgeist got it wrong over the weekend. They're talking about a good jobs report, blah, blah, blah. And there was that ISM report that you mentioned, which really showed uh, a slowing economy out there somewhere. Boom, up went equities. I'm with you on the boom. Payroll's got all the credit for the move in Friday's session. I just don't buy I saw it. the reporting over the weekend. The ISM... That wheat print that came up about 90 minutes after yeah. that payrolls report, that's what really drove the front end of the yield curve in America much, much lower, 20 basis points lower at the front end. So there was this feeling in the employment report that perhaps you've got a Goldilocks scenario or soft landing where wages are coming in even though there's a strong report. And then the ISM seemed to give that a double whammy punch and basically saying, look, you're going to have weakness. It's going to soften enough to bring some of the focus off the Fed, whether that's enough to stick through the CPI report on Thursday Thursday, and then bank earnings on Friday this week. Very another story. And Chairman Powell speaking tomorrow, yeah. Tom, off the back of all this data. One of those curious moments in the global economy, for the US economy more specifically, we've got the ISM on manufacturing and services in contraction and a Federal Reserve that's set to hike interest rates again, Tom, in the next couple of weeks. I was going to through your recession frenzy here. We've got the earnings coming out as well, but overarching this, and it's not the Goldman Sachs story. We'll have that a couple times here this morning, their, their layoffs. But, John, what I would really focus on is the dovetail here of not so much China, but on this Monday, the Pacific Rim signals it's opening up. We can go into that later. But I would overlay that on the things we'll hear from Chairman Well, Powell. I think we can talk about it now. So, number one, China reopening. So, they've dismantled that final barrier to entry into the yeah. Chinese economy, <clears throat> into the country. You can enter, Tom, now without quarantine. One, two, we're reporting here at Bloomberg that they're at least considering wider budget deficits. So, that fuels the reopening. But, Tom, have you seen a move in emerging market equities? Yeah, exactly. Re-entering a bull market, that's a 20% move of the October low. Yeah. That's a monster move in EM equities. My litmus paper here, folks, is the ADXY, the JP Morgan series, which is the currency pairs of the Pacific Rim, X Tokyo, X Japan. And that's, you know, it's not back up to where it was in 2019, but it's a nice move down and that spike up like equities. Equity futures right now at four tenths of 1%. Let's whip through the price action for you on the S&P 500 and beyond. We snapped a weekly losing streak last week on Friday with a big move higher. That move continues at four tenths of 1%. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley, 3,900, Tom. Easy sell. That's the note that comes from Mike this morning. Yeah, well, they're out there. They're, they're confirmed. And this is, again, as he made clear, this is not macro babble. It's off of earnings and such. And I believe on Friday we dive into that. Yeah, it's much lower on Friday's session. Just a little bit higher this morning. Lisa, we're up by three or four basis points on a 10-year, 359.67. And how much of that weakness that we saw, the softness, yields going down, a price going up, so perhaps strength in the actual price, how much is really driven by Europe? And I have to ask that, especially as we saw lower than expected CPI prints from Europe, but also this incredible rally in the boond by some metrics, the strongest first week of the year going back to uh, before 1990. Today, we get a sense of central bank speak ahead of Jay Powell tomorrow. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic at 12.30 p.m. Bank of England Chief Economist Hugh Pill at 5.30 p.m. in New York. I'm curious to see both sides of the Atlantic and how they're dovetailing with perhaps a better than feared winter and some of the energy prices as a pressure. Also, also just want to mention this, Austin Goolsby officially becomes today the Chicago Fed president. Today also the Three Amigos Summit is planning to start. U.S. President Joe Biden is planning to meet with Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador of Mexico and Justin Trudeau of Canada for this North American Leader Summit in Mexico City. How much is really uh, some of the immigration going to be at one of the contentions, especially after the controversy that President Biden has been fending off with some of the biggest numbers of apprehensions and encounters by Customs and Border Patrol going back several decades. And after market kicking off the earnings uh, 
release uh, system, the, the, the holiday of uh, bank earnings, we're going to be getting Jeffries. Q4, how much do they give a sense of what we're expecting to hear from J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, all coming out on Friday after a tumultuous year and, John, some of the worst returns when it came to profits from banking, from their bread and butter, going back to 2009. Hey, Lisa, thank you. Joining us now is Laurie Cavasina, head of U.S. equity strategy at RBC Capital Markets. Laurie, let's start there where Lisa finished. The bank earnings this week. What are you looking for from the likes of J.P. Morgan and others to get a broader read on what's happening here? Well, I always love hearing the comment from the banks about what's going on in terms of consumer deposits. Um, we also like hearing, you know, a lot about what's going on with our corporate clients. So that's really, you know, frankly, I care a little bit less about the actual bank earnings and I care more about those macro tidbits that we're going to get. But I have to tell you, John, I pulled up this morning just looking at my Bloomberg about the sector performance over the past month. Financials have actually done pretty well on a relative basis, and I never like that setup when financials have outperformed heading into reporting season um, because there's usually not that great of a setup, but we'll see what happens on Friday. Lori, I'm fascinated by the interviews we have away from your expertise talking about buy quality, which means Apple and three other stocks. Are there quality small caps? I mean, if, if somebody says in a big cap area, I want quality, can Lori Calvacina say that in mid caps and small caps? You can. It's on a relative basis, and you don't necessarily you know, have the ability to come in and make the argument, say your top quality small cap is better than you know, kind of your top 20% quality of large caps. But within the small cap space, you do generally tend to find that stocks with better ROEs, positive earnings tend to outperform over time. You really kind of have two different worlds within the small cap indexes. You have the teeny tiny micro caps that have no liquidity, nobody trades them, nobody pays attention to them. And then you have that kind of upper echelon that does have some pretty good quality. Now those typically get to be pretty crowded by small cap managers and typically get to be pretty expensive. But one of the reasons I love small caps right now is that upper echelon of market cap is actually actually pretty reasonably valued and we don't get an opportunity to buy those high quality small caps like this all that often. Lori, how concerned were you though by the ISM print that we got on Friday? The services component, supposedly the strongest one, coming in in contraction. Look, what it, whether or not this is a recession, something close to it, something that kind of smells like it but isn't quite is one, whatever it is, we need to go ahead and get it done. We need to go ahead and get it started from an equity market perspective. And obviously there's a human cost to that, and we're, we're not being disrespectful of that. But from a market pricing perspective, markets typically actually do well in negative GDP years and don't do well in sluggish GDP years, and that's historically because markets really can't handle that. Will we, won't we, will we, won't we? They just want to know. They just want to rip off the Band-Aid and get back to business. I think that certain parts of the equity market, like small caps, have been pricing in a plunge in ISM manufacturing for quite some time. The services side, though, is really what's been kind of feeding, uh, you know, kind of the, the inflationary fears. And so I do think we needed to see some damage there, uh, really to kind of get this inflation narrative under control once and for all. So we talk about what's priced in, right? That's been a sort of one of the big question marks for a lot of the analyst reports that we've been reading. And you took a look at how tech, consumer discretionary, and cons uh, communication services stocks accounted for 95 percent of the decline last year on the S&P. But tech is still overvalued by some measures. So at what point, how much more damage is necessary in that sector to become appealing to you? So I think that tech is an area, if we do get another bout of market volatility in the first quarter, and I do think that we're probably going to see that once reporting season sets in, I do think that tech is going to have a problem because I do think that that's where some of the earnings expectations do still need to be pulled down. Um, and typically, we really want to buy tech as a recovery story. So we need to put that market bottom in before we can really get to a point where you want to buy the tech sector. But the, 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 we go back to this quality issue, Lisa, because if I take a look at all the S&P 500 sectors and rank them in terms of quality, that classic tech sector, software, semi-hardware, that component, that really ranks as the highest quality part of the S&P 500. So you might not necessarily get super cheap valuations before investors will move back in. Mm. But you do probably need to get better valuations or at least more certainty around valuations than what you've got right now before you'll really see sustainable buyers come back. Lori, I spent the weekend trying to calibrate the gloom. In economics, we're seeing a lot of gloom. Are you seeing an in investment and its linkage over to finance? Are you seeing a lot of gloom from RBC Capital clients? 
We do. I mean, I spent a lot of time in December overseas talking to non-U.S. based investors. And I would say what was surprising to me, Tom, is that the sense of gloom was probably not as dire as I would have expected and not quite as dire as what I would have seen just from talking to U.S. based investors. Still pretty low. Um, but I, I got the sense that talking to non-U.S. based investors, they were starting to sense opportunities out of the U.S. And so they were still concerned generally that the U.S. was overvalued. But I was hearing actually sort of a benign discussion coming out of European-based clients in particular. Um, and that was something that surprised me. It felt like maybe we had in certain corners of this market really saw that gloom start to recede just a little bit. And that is something you do tend to want to look for at market bottoms. You can feel this hope, can't you, for 23, that this is the year that you get that international outperformance, Tom. We, talked we said about the same thing 12, 12 like, months ago. I think we said it the year before, the year before that, I know. Laurie, uh, thank you. Just fantastic. Laurie Cavacina of RBC Capital Markets. Big week ahead. CPI later this week. JP Morgan earnings on Friday. Chairman Powell tomorrow. Speaking of the gloom, gloom on Goldman Sachs trading floors, I'm sure, Tom, this morning. Our latest reporting indicating 3,200 jobs could go. I wasn't aware of this, but the stat in our reporting, 34%. Headcount was up 34% since the end of 2018, Tom, at Goldman. Was that different than tech? Is it different than well, the MSN? We're talking about where the excess uh, is and where the excess needs to be removed. And okay. tech and the world of finance right now, I think, hand in hand on that front. 49,000 employees. Three is what? Seven, eight percent, six percent or so. Normal this time of year is a three or four percent clear out. That's just healthy for the industry. Peter Deuteris had a great chart out this morning showing the differences between the major banks holding it together in other more entrepreneurial shops like Goldman Sachs, really, you know, off the mark. And that's why you're seeing this this morning. You mentioned that normal clear out, and Shanali Bassett will join us later in the hour to talk about this. Goldman hadn't had that normal clear out in the pandemic. It was avoided, Lisa. And I think that's why a lot of people think this number is larger because you've got to account for what didn't happen in the previous few years. The culling of the ranks, sort of trying to get the quality. It's interesting that more than a third of those cuts are going to be from the core trading division, though. So this is a broad-based kind of cut, well, not just the consumer banking industry. You know, it's rumored surveillance is going to have a one-third reduction. I mean, you know. <laughs> Where are you going with this? <laughs> Which one of us is it? I was about to say, you know, is there something like you're lottery. not telling me? There's something we don't yeah. know, Bramo. <laughs> Please, do collaborate. TK. Maybe in the break. TK, that's me. Coming up in the next hour, Alessio DeLonga, <laughs> Senior Portfolio Manager at Invesco oh, Investment Solutions. <laughs> He'll be here. One of us might not be. <laughs> Features up, four tenths. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The capital of Brazil is recovering from an insurrection by thousands of supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro. Rioters ransacked Congress, the presidential palace, and the top court in Brasilia on Sunday. It took hours for security forces to regain control. New President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva is vowing to prosecute the rioters. In El Paso, Texas, a confrontation between President Biden and Governor Greg Abbott. Abbott handed the president a letter demanding that he act immediately to stop unauthorized immigration. Since President Biden took office, the U.S. has experienced a large increase of migrants trying to cross the southwest border. In the U.K., British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak meets today with union leaders behind the strikes that have hobbled the country. Sunak is trying to avert further walkouts by rail, health and other workers. Unions want immediate pay hikes. According to The Guardian, Sunak may be open to a one-time payment to workers. China is trying to change the narrative that nationwide protests prompted President Xi Jinping to abandon the COVID-0 policy. According to a timeline published by the official news agency, the leadership started relaxing COVID restrictions before the protests began. On Sunday, China reopened borders that were largely shut for almost three years. And Goldman Sachs set for one of its biggest rounds of job cuts ever. Bloomberg's learned that Goldman is expected to eliminate about 3,200 jobs starting midweek. More than a third of those will likely come within its core trading and banking units. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
Over the weekend, rioters ransacking Brazil's capital. Thousands of supporters of ex-president Jair Bolsonaro storming the presidential palace and top court in Brasilia, testing the leadership of President da Silva just a week after he took office. TK, just phenomenal scenes over the weekend. They really were. The imagery was really extraordinary, and I, I would suggest it's a story still unfolding. What I did find interesting in the reporting, John, is how many of the Bolsonaro crew, the leaders, seem to be in Florida, or seem to be in the United States. You just you, you wonder about the convenience. Sure, I want to be very clear here, though, that the former president actually denounced this, came out, yes. Tom, and, yes. yeah. and did not like what he was seeing, and said that peaceful protest is one thing, but going after the institutions and breaking in is quite another. Yeah, Bloomberg with a huge contingent down in uh, Brazil, and we'll have reporting on that through the day. No other, no, no question about that. It's a, it's a story moving by the hour right now. She is moving to Mexico City, joining us now, Emery Horton, traveling with the president and our Bloomberg Washington uh, correspondent. I'm going to cut to the chase, Anne-Marie, and decide that the sweat over immigration, the sweat over migrants and all that is local. And what the people of Texas or Arizona would say is, President Biden, you're from Delaware, where on one study they had a count of 30,000 unauthorized immigrants, and Texas had 1.6 million. How does this president deal with the local focus of this issue of immigration? Well, immigration will be top of the agenda as the president meets with Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, the Mexican leader known very much so locally as AMLO, as well as with Canada's Justin Trudeau. Uh, but the president is on the heels of, of course, visiting El Paso. He got off the plane, and who was he greeted by? Governor Abbott yeah. with a handwritten letter saying that the president is $20 billion too short and two years too late. This has been the constant criticism of the Republican Party, that Biden has not put this as a central focus. His administration does seem to be doing that, not just with the El Paso visit, but also coming to Mexico on the heels of a new immigration plan, which I have to say is getting criticism from both sides, not just Republicans that it doesn't go far enough, but Democrats who also say it is just inhumane and human rights groups, because under this plan, 30,000 more a month can come from four countries where we've seen high levels of immigration like Venezuela, uh, Nicaragua, Haiti. But at the same time, if they do not go through the proper channels that the U.S. administration is outlining and they just go to the border, they will be sent out. And human rights groups say that that just undercuts asylum laws. And this has to do with the extension of Title 42, the controversial uh, law that was put into place under former President Trump and the question of who to expel. There is an issue of the need for workers. And I do wonder how much that is sort of in the conversations right. that president uh, that president biden is talking about with the his co-parts from mexico and from canada how much is that a focus well, it is a big focus because you've had the top three business communities from Canada, from Mexico, from the United States putting out a statement saying that this is what we actually need in terms of also seeing the electrification of the grid when you want electric vehicles. So much of these components are coming from Mexico. When you think of a critical resource, a raw material like lithium that really China has uh, the control over in terms of the global stockpile, some of that can come from Canada. So you have these groups coming out and say, we need to move past some disputes, part of the trade agreement, the USMCA, to work out. Huge on the agenda is going to be an energy dispute between the United States and Mexico. Also, when it comes to electricity, Canada has taken issue with it. They say that AMLO has these nationalist um, uh, provisions on the energy policies in Mexico. There's also potentially the protectionist issues with the dairy industry in Canada. So these are disputes that are going to come up. When you look at trade and potentially the workers that could be needed amongst these three countries, it is huge. And trade specifically, I read it was about $3 million worth of goods a minute that is being traded between North America, Canada, and Mexico. Lisa, I know you asked about uh, um, employment. That is going to be more of the immigration story between uh, all these three countries. But a lot of that also has to do with the fact that these three countries are so intertwined when it comes to their economies. And possibly more so, Anne-Marie, how much is the discussion moving toward nearshoring or friendshoring? Some of the questions that people have to move some of the trade away from the Pacific Rim. 
It is huge. Mexico has really taken a bite out of this idea of nearshoring. The fact that the United States wants to also diversify company supply chains away from Asia. And Mexico feels like they are in a top position to do that, especially when it comes to components for, I said, like automobiles. But also, last year alone, boats were up 266% going from Mexico to the United States. And all this has to do with nearshoring. This is something Mexico wants to bring at the top of the agenda because they think this is a place where they could become more of a top spot for American businesses that would normally look to Asian markets. Emory, I want to talk about the border. And this is, you know, I think for, for all of our listeners and viewers, the thing of most interest. And maybe it's the 23rd Congressional District, or maybe it's how well Mr. Biden did in the election against Mr. Trump uh, on the border. Are the Republicans making inroads? Is Mr. Abbott making inroads on the border as we move to the next election? Well, let's, let's say that Republicans at the moment, in terms of, they've been very critical of the Biden administration, but they've also said they are happy that he's finally went to the border. This is the first time the president has visited the border of his administration. I believe the last time the president was there when he was campaigning at one point, uh, though he did say, uh, send, of course, Vice President Kamala Harris. Um, so the Republicans say that they've, he, they've, he made inroads by going, but again, they say it's too short and it doesn't go far enough. And they think that this administration needs to go further and needs to be more of a hardline administration, a la going back to some of the Trump era policies that the Biden administration, many of them were scrapped on day one. Also, talking about, obviously, over the weekend, there was big news in Congress. We finally have a Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. One of their first agenda items of the, uh, the Republicans of, of the House is to potentially impeach Homeland Security um, Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. So this is going to be a huge fight going into 2023, and so much of it has to do with also the president election of 2024, because for Republicans, this is ground zero and issue number one when they are campaigning. AMH, great work. We'll catch up with you in the next hour. Looking forward to it. Amory Hordern there from Mexico City. We have a Speaker of the House, and Lisa... I imagine in a couple of months we'll be talking about exactly what you want to talk about, which is the debt ceiling risk around all of this. The example of the last week or so really underlining, underscoring the fact that we've got division between parties and division within parties, which is going to make it very, very difficult later this year to come to an agreement. Did you read all of some of the provisions that were put in there to weaken Kevin McCarthy for him to win? What was it? The 15th vote, the 14th vote in order to become Speaker of the House? Basically, anyone can upend his leadership in just one vote. So there's this question. We don't even know when the debt ceiling debate will really come to a fore. Some projections have said July is when we'll run out of money under the current projections, but others say probably is sooner than that. So where is the leadership to get some sort of deal done, given how weakened Kevin McCarthy is? I think Goldman is? put out a note at the end of last year, Tom, and indicated that at the earliest July, at the latest, maybe October. Yeah. Yeah. So crunch time is going deeper into summer. It's crunch time's there. And to Lisa's point, you know, I've been busting her chops on this, but actually I think she's been dead on about this time is different. We've heard that before. But simply this time is different after the concessions the speaker gave. Is I mean, the market response to it any different? No. Typically we buy treasuries could change when on the a risk dime. rises. Could change on a dime? Yeah. Well, no, no if you if you it. actually th – that note from Goldman that you're <clears> talking about <throat> pointed out that perhaps we won't see the move in treasuries, that perhaps where we'll see this is in growth, and that growth will get impeded as uncertainty starts to bleed into spending programs and into public programs that need to be financed on an ongoing basis. And so it might not be such a dramatic move, but could progressively have some sort of weakening uh, factor over time. I think the question remains, when do you start caring about it? I'll have this conversation with a couple of investors later, and I'll say the same thing. When do you start caring about it? I, I, I will care I, about it, just not right now. Exactly, because right be now people are just I, exhausted by totally. it. Totally. I grew up with some of this in my household as a kid, and I'm not going to mince words. It's a moral crusade for these conservatives. They're going to, you know, it's almost a Calvinistic thing. It's like being a Red Sox fan. There's a religion to it. 2011 repeat. I'm not willing to predict that, but I'm going to say it is a moral crusade. It's a moral crusade for a group of people now holding the speaker up, supporting him. Equity futures right now, positive a third of 1% on the S&P 500. In the next hour, coming up in about five or ten minutes, actually, we'll catch up with Mike Dada, macro strategist at MKM Partners and chief economist as well. Futures up, yield <coughs> tie up by four basis points on a US 10-year. Your 10-year yield this morning at 360. Your two-year up about three basis points. Your two-year yield, 427.
Lisa singing Keisha. You know, I watched some football, American football yesterday. Sure, okay. The tots weren't on, so I, you know, I watched the Lions, Packers, and all that. How stayed did that up way too. Out? It was good. I stayed up way too late. Had the, you know the marginal beverage, and it was great. But we should have like they do, where like they go to the Burger King ad and they still show, you know, what we're doing. I mean, it's great. It's like the Bramo Cam. Yeah. When the players are getting ready for the game, and you go to a commercial, but you let the the, yeah, the sport, same like, with us. But then you wouldn't be able to hear Lisa sing. You don't <laughs> have the audio. <laughs> you wouldn't need it. You, you just audio. see chaos, things throwing, and then all of a sudden, welcome back to Blue Book Surveillance. throwing things at us anyway. Oh, yeah, that's right. Futures on the S&P yeah, positive true. by a third of 1%. <laughs> on the NASDAQ up also by a third of 1%. Really strong gains to close out last week on Friday, up by more than 2% on the S&P for a <clears> weekly gain. Snapping a weekly losing streak on the S&P 500, a weekly gain of 1.5%. Actually, the biggest weekly gain going back to late November, you can thank not so much the payrolls report, but thank a sub-50 services ISM that we can discuss in just a moment. In the bond market, that meant yields dropped like a stone by more than 20 basis points at the front <clears> end. Your two-year 4.2744, trying to bounce back this morning by about two or three basis points. Just to round things out in foreign exchange for you, euro dollar, it's going to be interesting to see Chairman Powell with the Riksbank Bank tomorrow, talking about all things yeah. central bank independence, Sweden, and maybe we get a little bit of ECB in the mix as well, Tom. Euro You're selling it. You're selling euro. Like Six eighty up by a third of one percent on that currency. <laughs> When's plan. inflation? Wednesday is it? Inflation Wednesday? No, I think it's isn't it CPI Thursday? CPI, CPI Thursday. Thursday. Yeah, okay. and then JP Morgan on Friday. We Chairman Powell tomorrow. Okay. Let's get to this quote of Mike Wilson, Please. Of Morgan Stanley, this morning. It's thirty nine hundred an easy sell. This is what he has to say this morning. Go for it, Morgan <coughs> Stanley, the chief equity strategist. He oh, led with this: done. with both sell and buy side consensus so aligned, and you're familiar with what that is right now. It is a big dip in the front half and a rip in the second half. Everyone is starting to wonder how this view could be wrong. Mike goes on to say, we think it's in the magnitude of the move lower, led by much weaker earnings and a Fed committed to fighting inflation, making 3900 an easy sale, Tom. <clears throat> That's the message from Morgan Stanley coming into this week. Cautious messages, other people pushing against that and certainly pushing against it internationally, as we heard from Lori Calvacina. Sure. And then small and mid-cap space as well. Let's link all this together. We can do that with Michael Darda. He's been a wonderful supporter of what we've done for years. Chief economist, macro strategist at MKM Partners. Michael, I want to do a 60,000-foot question. How linked is the economy to the markets right now? Are they two separate entities, as some are telling us, or is there a tight linkage? Thanks for having me on, Tom. You know, there's a tight linkage, but it's nuanced. If we think about last year, what happened? You know, the economy was growing, except interest rates were shooting up dramatically, so that compressed valuations. I think the challenge for the stock market this year is really going to be on the earnings side. We know growth is slowing. I mean, that's frankly not even debatable at this point. Uh, but if we tip into a recession, you could have a fair amount of earnings weakness. Um, you know, Typically, forward earnings estimates are 25 to 30 percent above actual realized earnings right. at business cycle peaks. So. In the very short term, a falling rate structure will lift stocks. You know, we saw that last Friday, uh, but the earnings have to be there right. at the end of the day. And if that doesn't happen, the stock market's going to, to run into trouble this year. Michael Dart, our surveillance research shows that 99.825% of our people are indexed up. Is this a year where being selective and active management really, really matters? Yeah, I think this is going to be a volatile challenging year uh, for the equity market. Uh, if you're indexed up as a, as a retail investor and you're in it for the long haul, then don't even worry about what we're saying. You just have to ride it out. Uh, but if you're going to be benchmarked year to year, quarter to quarter, then I, I think it is going to require some foresight and maneuvering and understanding where we are in the business cycle. I want to go back to that Mike Wilson quote that John was reading. I think it's very interesting, this question around the commitment the Fed has to fighting inflation paired with the move that we saw on Friday. This question of softer than expected, let that front end rip, uh, yields lower, pawn price higher. Would this be a move that you would sell because you don't see the Fed letting up in its fight in inflation, even with softer than expected data on the wage front and on the, inf uh, the uh, services side? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's interesting. So the Fed is actually not data dependent here. They're path dependent. They've essentially chosen a policy rate at or just above 5% 
And the goal is to get there and then hold that level in place for an indefinite period of time, most likely you know, the balance of this year, uh, unless the economy crashes or financial markets crack in order to, to be assured that inflation is going to come down and stay down. That is not a setup for a soft landing, in my judgment. So what do you expect to hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell? Does it matter? Because at this point, do the words not even really make an impact on markets that are going their own way? Yeah, I think they matter in the sense that the Fed is really focused on some of the stickier measures of inflation. I mean, we did see markets respond favorably to the soft wage print, but the Fed's also focused on service sector inflation, which tends to lag the business cycle. It's a lagging indicator. And so inflation is going to be coming down this year. I think there will be good news there, just simply based on the lagged impact of the tightening the Fed has already done. But if they're really focused on slow-moving variables, then you have a setup for the Fed to over-tighten monetary policy and a recession to ensue. And that is the direct message of the Treasury yield curve. We're inverted now on every measure. Um, the policy rate is above the two-year yield now, all the way out. And a sustained, deep yield curve inversion is not a soft landing story. So it's kind of interesting that you know Wall Street strategists were tripping over themselves on Friday to declare the soft landing based on a one-day stock market rally. Uh, but I think if you read the credit markets and their, you know, their, their historical forward-looking power, um, I think we have to be concerned about that story and, and more braced for a, a downturn this year. And it may not be short and shallow. If the Fed wants to go to restrictive and hold, I mean, that's sort of the definition of how you could get into uh, a, a deeper downturn than than what most people are talking about with this short and shallow business. Hey, Mike, let's work through the data first. Let's talk about the sustainability of what we saw on Friday in the labour market report. Do you think it's sustainable to expect wage growth to back off with unemployment down at 3.5% and not climbing higher? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, those wage numbers tend to be pretty volatile, but there were some other interesting aspects of the report. One is that you have aggregate hours worked down two months in a row on a seasonally adjusted basis. And so typically before you end up with a lot of layoffs, hours worked are, are cut back. So it seems like that, you know, that that's happening now. You also have temporary help payrolls down five consecutive months. That's actually a, a leading indicator for overall job creation. And so I do think we are seeing signs, and you mentioned the ISM services index as well, um, plunging to a level that is usually, you know, only one time in history, it's history, have we seen it at current levels without a recession unfolding. So I think you know, there is accumulating evidence of a slowdown. Uh, and that's what the Fed wants. You know, they want to go to restrictive and hold. It, so <clears throat> growth falls below trend uh, and a and a negative output gap is is created. I mean, that's the intended policy. And, you know, that is a policy that essentially describes a recession. So that's just where we are. It's, you know, it's not a super positive message, but, um, you know, sometimes it's necessary to deliver it. Well, let's finish up with how Chairman Powell might acknowledge that tomorrow when we hear from him. There is a Q&A session, so there's opportunity to go in any direction here, Mike. As you know, without getting too deep into the Fed speak weeds, it's all about emphasis. And I just wonder if the emphasis will be on we're not sufficiently restrictive yet, or if the emphasis will be on we're getting closer to being sufficiently restrictive. Yeah, I think definitely. I mean, the markets know they're getting closer, uh, essentially, if priced in uh, terminal rate around 5%. Uh, a lot of the FOMC officials have sort of said that is their figure. Uh, and so I think Powell is just going to reinforce this idea that they're slowing down now in terms of the magnitude of the rate rises, but they're not ready to stop yet. And so they really want to get to a level that squeezes the life out of lagging indicators of inflation. Uh, and, and that's what financial markets and the business cycle are up against this year. Mike, this was awesome. Thank you, buddy. Mike Dada there of MCAM Partners. Pleasure. Just picking up on a weakness in the jobs report on Friday, including a reduction in house work, throwing that in and stirring up a toxic, toxic brew. Toxic brew. We haven't mentioned that for a while, have we? So well, 50 ISM, Manufacturing and Services. I'm glad you, you bring it up. Let's go there. It's pretty that negative is, stuff from Mike Dada. It there, is. Guys. That was, that was the gloom that's been out there for one week, two weeks, three weeks, or whatever. And post the jobs day, you know, you, you wonder, does it carry into this week? And 
I think it, I'm sorry. It all hinges on Inflation Thursday. Inflation Thursday. I, I'm See, sorry. Thursday. I mean, that could cut either way. I don't have a strong opinion. It's not for me to state it. But, but Inflation Thursday really, really matters. Well, you can cut up the hiking cycle three ways. One is the size of each move every meeting. The other is just the length of the hiking cycle. And then the duration you remain at the terminal rate. So let's deal with the first point first. Are we going to get that step down again? to a 25 basis point hike in early February, Lisa, based on the data we've seen so far. Well, we heard that uh, from Randy Krosner of the University of Chicago's Booth School on Friday because he was basically saying this gives them the leeway to buy insurance. That's how he characterized it. Whether or not that will make it a lower high that they end up at is a very other question. And you've got this rhetoric with a lot of people, including Michael Darda, saying they still have to go pretty far and they are still committed to that. I thought the note from Ellen Zetner of Morgan Stanley going into the weekend was pretty interesting on this front. They're looking for that 25 basis point move off the back of some of the data we've seen, but they think the overall labor market resiliency may introduce the risk or raise the risk that you extend the hiking cycle. So maybe you drop down to 25s, Tom, but ultimately if the labor market remains uh, as resilient I mean, as it has been, and that's their view and not maybe not yours at home listening to this, to, you, you but Tom, up, ultimately there is the risk there that you extend the hiking cycle. Y yes, that is the risk that, I'll, that I think a lot of people have. And there's people that say we're a long ways uh, from that. I would point out to your scenarios, I'm less worried about 25, 50 and all that, but as Mr. Darda said, the length of time that we stay at a certain level and this harkens back. Can we, we're not saying Happy New Year today, right? No, we're done. Alan Blinder in his essay <laughs> in the Wall Street Journal, and I believe it was Friday, maybe Thursday, uh, makes clear he said Happy New Year. And he said, look, inflation is falling dramatically. That's from the former vice chairman of the Fed. And that's the metric we have to look at. And that goes back to this Thursday. Well, you've touched on the heart of the debate coming into 2023. They're telling us they're going to hike maybe towards five and then stay there. And this market, well, many people sitting here trying to price in the prospect of rate cuts. I have to be careful, John, because I'm so x-axis driven from school years ago. But to me, it's all an x-axis study. You push it out? Put, that's what, yeah, and who was good at this was Geithner. Geithner was very, very good in the heat of 08, saying all we're going to do is push this thing out. You know who's good at this? Mike Schumacher. Yes, very good. In the next yes, hour, 50 yes. minutes away. Looking forward to catching up with him. Equity <clears throat> futures up by a third of 1% from New York this Monday morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Brazil's President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva is vowing to prosecute rioters who stormed the country's top government institutions on Sunday. The insurrection by thousands of supporters of ex-president Jair Bolsonaro follows months of protests since the conservative leader lost to Lula by a razor-thin margin in election runoff. Lula is calling for a federal intervention. On Capitol Hill, new House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is rallying Republicans with promises to cut spending and strengthen border security. Still, in order to win the position, McCarthy had to give up more leverage to the party's right wing. He promised a rule change that would allow a single lawmaker to call for a vote to oust the speaker. Russian President Vladimir Putin's plan to squeeze Europe by weaponizing energy looks to be fizzling. Mild weather and efforts to reduce demand are helping. Gas reserves are still nearly full and prices have fallen to pre-war levels. Europe is likely already through the worst of the energy crisis. Richard Branson's Virgin Orbit says it's on track for Britain's first ever space launch tonight. The takeoff of a modified Boeing 747 jetliner with a rocket under its wing is planned between 9.40 and 11 p.m. The mission will deploy nine satellites for a range of customers. And Apple exported more than $2.5 billion of iPhones from India from April to December. And that's almost twice the previous fiscal year's total. And it underscores how Apple is accelerating a shift away from China. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. It's not that the Fed wants fewer jobs, what they want is lower wage growth, more um, because they're worried about persistent inflation. Um, 70 to 80 percent of all of the, uh, the costs of our production in the U.S. is related to jobs and, and wages. And so if that's going up really fast, that can make it very difficult for inflation to come down. 
Softer wage growth on Friday, throw in a sub-50 ISM, and apparently bad news is good news for this equity market. That was Randy Krosner, the former Federal Reserve governor. Your equity market building on the gains of Friday on the S&P 500, up by a third of 1%. You will hear from Chairman Powell tomorrow. You'll get some CPI data on Thursday. And then Friday, it's all about the banks, with JP Morgan kicking off bank earnings on Wall Street. Goldman Sachs, the latest from them, planning to cut more than 3,000 jobs <laughs> This week, according to our reporting, one third in its core trading and banking units. A Bloomberg Shinali Basek spoke to the Goldman CEO, David Solomon, just last month. Uncertain time given we're changing monetary and economic conditions very, very quickly. And that's certainly having an impact to slowing down economic activity. And so if you're running a big financial services firm, I think you have to assume that we have some bumpy times ahead. It's EK bumpy times right now. Right now, no question about it. And there's an immense divide between what they're doing and Jeffries and the rest and what we're seeing from the major banks that they're always trying to compare themselves to. And ultimately, how much of this we're going to see, Tom, at a quarter's ahead? Well, yeah, we're going to dive into it with the earnings season. It starts Friday, right, John, after inflation Thursday? With we J.P. Morgan, yeah, and then I think Friday. Goldman next Tuesday. Yeah, it's, we're, we're going to be a lot smarter into Wednesday, Thursday of, of, of next week on this. But, John, what I would really, really emphasize is how fluid the situation is, and the heart of it is who do you want to be? Shelley Bassick joins us here on this day of Goldman Sachs uh, layoffs. Is the heart of the matter that the management of Goldman Sachs wants to be more like Bank of America and J.P. Morgan. They're 300 basis points per year behind them over the last decade. I think what's difficult to ask about a question like that is it implied that big move into consumer banking. But from the beginning, <clears throat> there have been a lot of doubts about how big they could really get in that kind of a business. The idea was for this moment <laughs> to really be a stable part of the bank, a stable force, as a lot of those other businesses, trading, banking, were very cyclical. The thing is, it didn't get to scale very quickly, right. and now they're on track to lose about $2 okay. billion dollars in the consumer well, unit. Let's so move forward here to William S. Cohen's great book on Goldman Sachs. Everything happens at, at Three Guys, Five Guys, whatever the breakfast place is on Madison Avenue. They're going to go in there to a booth at Three Guys on Madison Avenue, and they're going to sit down and say, am I right? We have a $2 billion loss in Goldman Sachs banking? Listen, a few things that are... That conversation's never happened at Goldman Sachs, right? Yeah, of course not, because they didn't have this unit just five years ago, or really to the scale at five years ago. So at the beginning, I remember having conversations inside of Goldman, and so much of the purpose was to diversify, but also lower the cost of funding for Goldman Sachs. But the cost to do that, Marcus is still giving you 335 on a high-yield savings account. Most of the large banks have not budged among 0.01%, so it costs a lot to get customers. And uh, there was some actually really great reporting in Samifor as well from Liz Hoffman that showed you it wasn't all just uh, the decisions they made. They hit a lot of hiccups along the way. One interesting one being an uh, issue with the vendor who was also an investment banking client. So I thought that was a very interesting tension as Goldman expands. How do they expand not just to meet the consumer but to keep their existing client happy? Yeah, but how much of these cuts really are, as John was <clears throat> talking about earlier, just sort of delayed attrition? delayed uh, culling of the ranks that we didn't see during the pandemic era. A lot of that is definitely true because in the pandemic they were making so much money and by the way even this coming year they're expected even with profits really falling off they're expected to post their second best ever year by revenue. So I think we really have to quickly change this discussion because yes 3,200 people is a lot of people. It is not 2008 style cuts, but more importantly, with them cutting 3,200, Morgan Stanley cutting another thousand, most other banks starting to cut by the hundreds, you have to start to ask where the capacity comes from because there's nowhere to hire out of that fire. Well, but there's also this issue right now of all of the people who are getting laid off. Will this bank be smaller than it was in 2018? With some of the tech companies, there's a real question of where we're retrenching to. What is the level where we're retrenching to or is it just sort of pairing around the edges to a much bigger footprint than they had pre-pandemic? You know, with 3,200 people, I don't want to say that's a small number by any means, but to the point you're making, you don't get back to 2018. They've made acquisitions mm. in that time frame. The headcount has grown ex uh, very dramatically. They've hired a lot of people that are not just at the very top level of senior banker here because they had so much work to do. If you remember, even the young people, right, that brought oh, up the cost about. base by a base salary rising per banker, right. uh, 50000 a pop, right? So you already had uh, fixed costs rising, and revenue is right. on the precipice of decline. John and I were three guys having breakfast trying to recapitulate what Goldman Sachs did there years ago with all their important conversations. A waiter came up to us and whispered in my ear, 
SPACs. <laughs> okay, is this just unloading the failed equity efforts of the last 24 months? Can I mention something else, too? You know, you have this exuberance really getting out of the system. There are tons of people that are excited about that. Let's be honest about this. Excited There's about what? The fact that the, the SPAC wave is over, the crypto boom is done, right? This idea that maybe you might see some distressed opportunities come back. You might have some interesting credit opportunities come back. So the client base starts to shift also. You touched on the work environment. Can we sit on that for a moment? I think we all remember that story. Was it the first year analyst that came out with the PowerPoint presentation? Exactly. This We're was a couple years ago. It. Do you think there's going to be some grit that returns to Wall Street? Because I think a lot of people that work on Wall Street in the last couple of years think that things have got a little bit too soft. Yeah. Maybe a little bit too soft. Do you think a bit of grit returns? A hundred percent the grit returns. You know, I was talking to some younger bankers over the last week or so. And I'm shocked. Yeah, you know, at this point, I'm a decade older. So, uh, But, you know, the conversation was when we, they talked to their friends on Wall Street, some of them don't want to stay in the business. They're f afraid, right? Some of them are the most excited they've ever been in their career because they realize this is the time that might make their career uh, if you can get through this cycle. You also start to get – this is a time where you're not talking to the banks for money. You're talking about to the private equity guys for money. Those are the guys that are still lending, well, and they have so well, much dry powder on the sideline. Tell, tell everybody, this is important. Why is Wall Street any different than any other sector? Sector, money isn't free anymore. Well, I think the I mean, fact that's that, the heart of the matter. So I think the fact that tech is also in a bit of trouble right now changes the game on Wall Street. I think I for the last decade yes. or so, yes. the hiring managers at these big banks felt like they were competing with what was happening in big tech. And I think the reason why the analyst community had so much leverage, the first year analyst straight out of college, <clears> is because these banks couldn't offer them the upside that existed elsewhere. That's a massive, massive change. And the fact that you get the return of discipline, Tom, 5% interest rates, putting tech in trouble, I think changes the game on the street as well. I have to, you also have to ask about the consumer, too, because at the point about Bank of America and J.P. Morgan, they hit a lot of trouble last year in the face of higher interest rates. This is supposed to be their time. So if you look at the rest of this year, remember, consumers still have stimulus. They still have the student loan moratorium. That's hundreds of dollars a month that they are not paying, that they can use to pay down credit card debt and other things. Got, got to be pretty bold to be the first-year analyst that does that PowerPoint presentation presentation at the moment, haven't you, Tom? Can you imagine <laughs> yeah, that? You might be gone. Right now. Yeah, I don't know if that's a great idea. Yeah. Well, I imagine they're in the office, which is also different. I imagine they're all in the office you and think? nobody is in their pajamas anymore. <laughs> and everybody is going to be wearing suits. They, wear in suits and ties. they might mean, get I mean, away with the Lululemon on the way to the gym, but then on the way out, they better see you. You mentioned Lululemon. <laughs> <Okay, Shinali laughs> <Basak. laughs> well, that was the perfect segue. Exactly. There. <laughs> Shinali, thank you. Shinali Basak there with the latest, Lisa, yeah. the latest out of Lulu. Margin pressure. Yeah, exactly. And you're seeing those shares plunging more than 9% in pre-market trading because they do expect margin contraction after so many years of expansion. This is uh, this is now a shares lower than more than 11%, moving very quickly. Now seeding net revenue at 2.6 to 2.7 billion dollars uh, versus the estimate which was about the same thing, but still earnings per share coming in much lighter. And again, how much is this a story that is going to be a feature throughout all of the retail sector? Nike and Under Armour are also lower. Yeah, you mentioned Nike, results. Tom. Nike down by about 1.5% off the back of some of this. Yeah, well, it's, it's going to happen. And I mean, this is into the earnings season that Mike Wilson and, frankly, everybody else is talking about. Now, I go back to Stuart Kaiser. You mentioned Schumacher coming up. These guys, their basic theme is it's going to be very selective. And whether you're talking economic analysis or investment analysis, the choice set seems to be shrinking down rapidly. It's interesting, though, especially in light of what Shanali was talking about. The company now expects that it will further leverage selling general and administration expenses uh, and their basic you know, idea here, where are they going to cut costs? Are we going to see labor market effect, the labor market being affected by margin compression as a way to address some of the potential pitfalls in profits? We're getting slammed on Lulu. Nike down by about a little more than 1%. No real drama in that stock. I think you said Under Armour was down as well. Yep. At least from the pre-market. So retail, sports retail, getting hammered at the moment uh, if you are Lululemon, TK. Is the heart of this like at Lululemon? I've got the license to train jogger. You know, after you've bought four pair of those, do you need to buy a fifth pair? You want some Lulu? <laughs> yeah, of course do you? I do. Do you? The yeah, ones with the pockets, the stretch chisel. pants with the with the pockets. And no, the I don't have. No, 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 we decided that was Where vetoed. Like... Vet Bill said he wouldn't <laughs> walk with me with, with that. But I do have the license, you know, the, the, the license to train I've got to be honest with you, I wouldn't walk with you either. <laughs> Alessio De Longis, the senior portfolio manager at Invesco Investment Chanel Solutions. Just shaking her head. <laughs> Joining us in just a moment. Structure for Chanali. <laughs> Equities up a third of one percent. Thank you for Chanali. It's good to see you from New York. This is Bloomberg.
the Fed is going to be late. I think that the Fed is imposing a severe slowing on the economy. They'll pause if inflation is declining, but they won't be able to if they're not uh, achieving their inflation objectives. They're looking for slower inflation, but still nowhere near target. The Fed, as well as every other central bank in the world, got it wrong. They said, oh, transitory, transitory, transitory. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. This week, how much more do you want? CPI, Chairman Powell, earnings season begins. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance and TV and Radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures adding to Friday's gains. TK, the S&P, up a third of 1%. It's a nice lift and it comes off the big, big lift that we saw on Friday. I would note also, Jonathan, critically off China reopening oil up 3%. Gets my attention. Brent crude, $81 a barrel. Big moves we saw in the equity market on Friday. Big moves we saw in the bond market as well. Yields lower a whole lot lower. We've got to tease out the economic data what on earth it means at the moment, Bramo, and spare a thought for Chairman Powell, who's got to respond to this tomorrow. Will it matter? Will anything he say actually have credibility in markets? Because a lot of the Fed officials have been saying the same thing. They've got more work to do, and this market is saying, we're seeing soft landing, we're seeing this perfect ending here uh, with two data prints that might suggest that things aren't as strong as previously Do you expected? think those 50 go. ISMs scream soft landing? People are saying you need to see that softness in services. And the reason why people say that as a soft landing and not a hard landing is because wages are coming <clears> off, but the numbers on the headline number are still strong. So people are talking about a soft landing. Again, does this matter? It is one data print. How much does this actually indicate what's coming? Although you are seeing uh, earnings starting to trickle out perhaps more than Mike Wilson. To, uh, That's the downside risk. Let's talk about the upside risk. China reopening. The rip we've seen in EM equities. Emerging market equities up more than 20% since the lows of October, Tom. Big moves we're seeing here. I'm going to go back to Blinder's essay in the Wall Street Journal, the gentleman from Princeton, the former vice chairman, where he says, look, here's the reality. China's reopening. Pacific bid with uh, Pacific Rim with a bid. John, I mentioned ADXY with a nice lift there. Lori Calvacina in the last hour uh, talking up. We've got a killer guest. Must listen, must watch for uh, Global Wall Street coming up. And this is on the optimism. This year it will not just be the United States. Mike Schumacher of Wells Fargo coming up in about <clears throat> 28 minutes. Alessio De Longis of Invesco coming up very, very shortly. Alessio, a month ago, constructive risk. Nailed it. And DM and International specifically. We'll pick up on that in a moment. Equity futures right now up a third of 1% on the S&P 500. Just to whip through the price action briefly. Yields a little bit higher by three or four basis points on a 10-year. 359.48. Euro dollar, Tom, approaching 107 here. 106.85. Dollar dynamics with the yuan really there. 6.78, distant from 7 yuan per dollar. The renminbi showing strong China strength. And again, I'm going to take that. Jay Pulaski, who I know is, you know, Jay won't get up first, folks. Full disclosure, he's got to slide in <laughs> with Pharaoh in the 9 o'clock midday hour. I haven't spoken to Jay but, for months. Well, get him on because I, because I think he's been right. And he shouldn't be punished on the when of it. He couldn't predict a China lockdown. It's over. And now we're ripping. I priced... And Jay's getting what he wanted, I ultimately, priced business, just late. business class to Shanghai today. How much? $34,000. Are you kidding? That's for one seat. Are you kidding? $34,000, one seat, nonstop. Wow. Wow. S seriously, what airline? I will... This is United. Uh, full disclosure, I've got family in China, so we want to get over there. But the answer is I'm going to monitor that and watch it come down to something... Intelligent. Can you meet halfway? Can you meet somewhere else? Uh, it's under collegial discussion. We brought in McKinsey to handle those okay. negotiations Great. within the family. Well, if you want some consulting, you know, <clears throat> I'm available. Okay, thank you. Okay, Lisa, we've worked that out. Yeah, you haven't worked out the fee. At least uh, that will be, I guess, the negotiation in the break as to your consulting services. Today, as far as meeting in the middle, Central Bank Speak includes both Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic at 12.30 p.m. And on the other side of the Atlantic, Bank of England Chief Economist Hugh Pill at 5.30 p.m., although he will be speaking in New York. Also, it is notable that Austin Goolsbee becomes the president of the Chicago Federal Reserve. How much do we get a sense of them pushing back against the excitement around a soft landing type of scenario, or do they lean into 
into it. Do we get any signal that perhaps they're excited and they're going to welcome this to possibly slow down the pace of rate hikes and the end result? Today, we also get the Three Amigos Summit. That would be Joe Biden of the U.S., Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador of Mexico, and Canada's uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau all uh, joining together in Mexico City for this North American Leaders Summit. A lot of issues on the table, very much, uh, Tom, as you've been mentioning, the immigration question around uh, the yeah. United States, but also at a time when so many people are talking about moving manufacturing to local areas. How much do we get a sense of some meat behind that versus some of the uh, contradictions that people have with, uh, with, with, with where those trade policies should go? And after market kicking off that earnings season for the banking industry, Jeffries expected to release the fourth quarter results. Question mark, especially ahead of J.P. Morgan releasing on Friday, along with a host of the other major banks. How much do we get a sense of the uh, cutbacks that we saw in Goldman that we were just talking about with Shanali versus where the profits are going to be? Where are those opportunities as you do start to get more dislocations and potentially more distress, John? What a tough 12 months yeah. for BFA, looking at those numbers there. Unreal. Bramo, thank you. Joining us now is Alessio <laughs> DeLongis, Senior Portfolio Manager at Invesco Investment Solutions. Alessio, wonderful to catch up with you, buddy, as always. They say there is a bull market somewhere always. Alessio, right now, it's in emerging markets. Can that continue? Yeah, I think it can continue. Emerging markets are seeing now both equity and fixed income are seeing a, a, a great setup due to primarily two or three major, major forces. The China reopening, which we may debate whether it is a global scale event or not, but it's certainly an EM wide relevant event. You have very attractive valuations and a dollar cycle that has finally turned, coupled with the peak in interest rates. So we all know it, it's it's the best time to be overweight emerging markets, both equity and fixed income. When when the Fed is close to the end of its tightening cycle and signaling a pause, when the dollar is depreciating and ex extremely expensive, and in this particular case, the China reopening trade. So the constellation is very supportive for an EMR performance over the foreseeable future. You know, Alessio, I know you're going to tell me that it's, it varies client to client, but the bottom line at Invesco is if you're going to make the DeLongas call and go into international, do you pile in or do you just go in with a measured amount? How big is the conviction? From a from a tactical standpoint, the conviction and relative to the United, relative to the United States, the conviction is very high. Now, uh, from a from a total return perspective, the conviction has to be mitigated. Let's not forget the yield curve is inverted by a hundred basis points. The recession is not a question of if; it's a question of when. So, when that recession really comes, but it could be 12 months away or more. When the recession comes, the high beta markets, Tom, which is, I believe, the nature of your question, the high beta markets such as international equities and emerging markets will suffer. We, we, in that scenario, we will see markets with a bias towards value, a smaller capitalization, tend to underperform, and the dollar will shine again. But my point is, from a tactical standpoint, sitting on bearish defensive trades, for too long, it's an, a very expensive proposition. So the way we position it to our investors is look at finally diversify into EM and into international equities because we know there is an absolutely massive home bias in favor of U.S. equities, which have outperformed now for 15 years. So, Alessio, how much of this long international equities hinges on the weather and the weather in Europe and on the situation with respect to China and not seeing necessarily a dramatic increase in their imports of natural gas? Well, that's a good question. It highlights a little bit maybe the tactical nature of the, of, um, of the call. I wouldn't call it necessarily too much dependent on the weather. Uh, I, I see exactly where you're going with this. The, the pricing uh, driven by market participants was extremely bearish. What we're beginning to see, though, is actually in the economic data, uh, consumer confidence surveys across the board are rising from deep recessionary levels, and they're bouncing back up. So to your point, the weather expectation, so to speak, the energy crisis may have driven us to recessionary or depression-like consumer sentiment. I think the skew of the risk, the, the downside here is more mitigated. The reality is that Europe is seeing the benefits of Europe and the UK are seeing the benefits of extremely cheap currency valuations, which on, on the margin begin to feed very well into future earnings growth. So not so much dependent on the weather, but rather the fact that the cycle of bearish 
sentiment in Europe seems to run out of uh, new fuel. Alessio, you were constructive on the international story a number of months ago, and I was there questioning you about it, and it's delivered in a big way in the last couple of months, that's for sure. Alessio DeLong is there. I'm in Vesco. Alessio, thank you. Also questioning this story is Bank of America and Sebastian Radler, who said this just last week, and I'll read you the quote verbatim. We think the next big story for markets will be a sharp loss of growth momentum in response to aggressive monetary tightening. The team at B of A, on that side of the business anyway, went on to say, this is not yet priced, with markets buoyed. You say buoyed, right? Buoyed, buoyed. Yeah, yeah. buoyed. buoyed makes sense. You say buoyed? We say buoyed. You say buoyed? Well, buoyed makes no sense at all. No, By strong activity on easing supply issues, but fading gas better. prices and China reopening. I think we lost the point somewhere in all of that. <laughs> anyway, you get the picture that maybe the China reopening story for Europe is a bit of a head fake because what we're about to confront is a real deceleration in the economy. Which I think is the flip side of the tactical issue that we just heard about from Alessio DeLongas. This question of, OK, perhaps this is a tactical issue of things being oversold and over-pessimistic, but it doesn't necessarily mean the all-clear is being signaled that suddenly you're going to see some sort of rampant growth. <clears throat> Certainly the dominant force at the moment, Tom, has been that reopening story. In China, without a doubt, and our I latest lost my reporting, train of thought. I'm, I'm our latest reporting suggesting they will void. be looking at wider budget deficits. I know you want to continue this, well, but that's actually really interesting because suddenly you're getting both prongs: China reopening and stimulus, basically yeah. a, a greater allowance Critical to point. increase Critical some of the deficit point. spending in order to buoy <clears> the economy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what buoyed me this morning was seeing the as fiscal stimulus. As soon as I saw stimulus, that, was, as as I saw it, I knew it was over. There. Let's buoy ourselves by talk here about the translation uh, moment. I think it's Premier League football this weekend. I can't tell. you got so many different leagues going on over there. And I, I'm told there'll be a derby of some There's, there's a North London derby this weekend. It's a derby or derby. We're buoyed by the conversation. You know, recently you've over watched, oh, you've watched more derby. football than I have recently. After the World Cup, I'm just like, my, it just, I'm so out of sync with a World Cup in the middle of the season. No, yes. I'm and just for you, it must like, be, yes. shouldn't for there you, be a it must summer be break now? I just, I'm yeah. not ready to get back into it quite No, I, quite I've the heard same of some way. other people as well. My issue is I'm getting tackled on the street by Tots supporters. I saw that. They messaged me. <clears throat> you know, there's like... The, it's the like, gentleman it's, from PWC. It's, well, that's just not one guy. There's a lot of people. They come by. They're wearing Tots swag and that. And, and you know. what do you say about it? I, I say it's a derby, and they say, no, it's a derby because they're buoyed. Do you have an official position on whether Antonio Conte should stay? I, I am not smart enough to know if he should stay, but, but aren't we there yeah. now? <laughs> but uh, isn't it a big debate right now, When John? does he start calling them the it's Spurs? It's my favourite with Tom. Whatever the subject, <laughs> football, markets, the economy, politics, I won't but. give you my opinion, but. Right, exactly. Not next And then he proceeds but. to give no, you his I'm opinion. I'm not informed enough. <laughs> OK. But. but from New York, this is Bloomberg. I, I just, I don't know. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The capital of Brazil is recovering from an insurrection by thousands of supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro. Rioters ransacked Congress, the presidential palace, and the top court in Brasilia on Sunday. It took hours for security forces to regain control. New President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva is vowing to prosecute the rioters. In El Paso, Texas, a confrontation between President Biden and Governor Greg Abbott. Abbott handed the president a letter demanding that he act immediately to stop unauthorized immigration. Since President Biden took office, the U.S. has experienced a large increase of migrants trying to cross the southwest border. And in China, trying to, China is trying to change the narrative on nationwide protests prompted President Xi Jinping to abandon the COVID-0 policy. Now, according to a timeline published by the official news agency, the leadership started relaxing COVID restrictions before the protests began. On Sunday, China reopened borders that were largely shut for almost three years. The European Central Bank is strengthening the case for more interest rate hikes. It predicts that wage growth, a key indicator of where inflation is headed, will be very strong in the coming months. The ECB says that reflects robust labor markets that haven't been substantially affected by the slowing of the economy. And Goldman Sachs set for one of its biggest rounds of job cuts ever. Bloomberg's learned that Goldman is expected to eliminate about 3,200 jobs starting midweek. More than a third of those will likely be within its core trading and banking units. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Kevin McCarthy uh, and I have had some positive forward-looking conversations uh, over the last few weeks 
Uh, and I'm hopeful uh, that we'll be able to build upon those conversations to do the right thing for the American people. Clearly, we are going to have strong disagreements at times. Uh, but we can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. That is what I believe the American people would like to see. Did we just get a chaotic appetizer for the year ahead down in Congress? <clears throat> that right there was the House Democratic leader, Hakeem Jeffries, speaking to NBC over the weekend. Live from New York City, good morning to you. Your equity market building on the gains of Friday, up by four-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields are high by three basis points on a 10-year, 359.11. Yields were aggressively lower in Friday's session as wage growth came in a bit softer. And the ISM services indicator came in sub-50 in contraction territory. <laughs> Your next big stop for this market, of course, is Chairman Powell tomorrow, Tom. We hear from him, I believe, at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Then it's CPI Thursday, just a couple of days away. Yeah, CPI Thursday to me is a huge, huge deal. And then we launch, John, right into the earnings on Friday and into Morgan, Monday, yeah. I believe, as well. So it's going to be a real backloaded uh, end of uh, the week. We're going to stop the show right now. And we're going to talk about Greg Vallier of New Hampshire, which is the drug entry capital of the United States of America at one point. And he and I would describe what it did to his New Hampshire. It is unmentioned among the three amigos in Mexico City. Our Anne Marie Horton is there, always up to speed. She's our Bloomberg Washington correspondent. Anne Marie, I think the whole conversation is sanitized with a huge arrest three or four days ago on the opium battle. I take real issue with opioids, fentanyl, all the other jargon that's soft peddled. All this is about is heroin. What are these three guys going to do about the drug tragedy of North America? Well, Tom, as you just alluded to, this comes on the heels of the Mexican authorities uh, r arresting El Chapo's son. This was really a huge coup for the U.S. It's something they wanted to be seen. And there's been a lot of pressure on the Mexican government, on AMLO from the U.S. administration, to crack down on these drug cartels. And one of the biggest uh, drugs that is trafficked by this individual and, and uh, some of these Mexican cartels is fentanyl. And that is why you have a huge amount of individuals paying close attention to the amount of narcotics because not just this is highly addictive, <clears throat> yeah. but this is lethal. And the number of individuals between 18 and 50 year olds dying from fentanyl is rising. And you have a senator, Tom, from West Virginia, Shelley Moore Caputo, writing over the weekend an op ed because she said, even though I'm in West Virginia, why I care so much about the border is the increase in fentanyl, what that means okay, for but, her community. You know, John Farrell's talked about China being a bipartisan issue. Let me suggest that opium or heroin is a bipartisan issue. What are we going to do mm -hmm. about it? Well, it is a bipartisan issue, and I think when you talk to both sides of the aisle, they want to see more funding when it comes to the, uh, the drug enforcers um, and also the fact that, especially when you talk to and you see some of the plans the administration has wanted to put forward, is more resources and funding to these local governments, whether it's Mexico or other areas in South America, so that they are investing in the fact that potentially more people are not going into the jobs of supporting or being part of the cartel. Because when you saw the kidnapping of El Chapo's son, you can almost see that these are in themselves military states within a country. And Marie, the focus for you, I know, is in Mexico City and for perhaps Joe Biden, but for everybody else, people want to understand what the aftermath is from the C-SPAN ratings bonanza, which has been the negotiations over the Speaker of the House. There is a question of what the ramifications are for some of the concessions that we saw from Kevin McCarthy in order to get uh, to become the House Speaker. What is the sort of projection of what this gridlock will look like, the internecine gridlock among Republicans? Well, you could even talk to Republicans like Representative Gonzalez, who on Face the Nation over the weekend talked about the fact that C-SPAN ratings is going to continue. Even little procedural, I would call maybe the plumbing of Congress, the plumbing of democracy, electing a speaker, they're going to have a vote on the House rules. All of this usually just evaporates from the headlines and is pretty much uh, American public ignores it. Now, 
This is prime time, days spent on this, and the next big fight, I mean, we should note they're meeting at 10, some of these GOP leaders to discuss who's going to get top positions on committees and who is also going to staff those committees. But the next big fight is going to be the House Rules Package. Again, the plumbing that normally is completely ignored from headlines is becoming another big fight from Republicans. You had Representative Gonzalez saying he's a no on it because he's worried about potential defense cuts. Then you have another representative also speaking on Face the Nation, Nancy Mays of South Carolina, talking about the fact she doesn't like how it went down. And she doesn't know what the informal list is that Speaker now Kevin McCarthy was able to do in backroom doors. She doesn't like these gentlemen handshakes and what that can mean. So you're going to have the Democrats obviously united against this rules package, but at the same time, potentially some no's or absentees from Republicans. So potentially this is going to be another fight like it was for their speakership. And this is just the plumbing. My point is, when we get to really must pass issues like the debt ceiling, there's going to be major fights. And Marie, we were talking earlier in the show about when it matters for markets, right? This question of we always get a debt ceiling debacle. We always get some sort of fight that goes to the last hour. How much are we going to see a different tenor this time around? When should the market start caring about ramifications? And what exactly would those ramifications look like? I personally think the market should start caring now, or maybe they should have started caring last week. But this is going to really come to the forefront in early this summer. And then, of course, we have federal spending with the fiscal year ending September 30th. What the Republicans want is the fact that they want negotiations to be about raising the debt ceiling, concessions on federal spending. They want to cap. Uh, 2024 spending at 2022 levels. Chip Roy has said over the weekend that everything is on the table. That would include defense. This is going to draw the ear of some of these uh, hawkish defense Republicans. At the same time, Lisa, you have the administration saying that when it comes to the debt ceiling, there will be, quote, no hostage taking. That was the word from the president's press secretary at Air Force One to reporters yesterday. So I would say these fights are already going to start to happen now. Representative Chip right. Roy, ultra right, he was part of this insurgency, is saying we need to get in a room now. I guess that is a good <clears throat> sign for the markets. But uh, this is going to be a big debacle. Uh, very quickly, Anne-Marie. When McCarthy does a John Boehner and turns to the Democrats, what happens? I'm not sure you're going to see that, Tom. I am not sure you're going to see this individual, even though, yes, it is a very slim majority, really want to turn to the Democrats. He's going to have to in terms of getting concessions, but it's going to be very difficult for him to want to get Democrats on board to pass legislation over the line. Because remember, to get this speakership, there is now a provision of one member can vote to vacate. That means one individual, and we've seen a few of these backbenchers, call for a vote of confidence on his speakership. So he is coming into this position incredibly weak. Potential chaos through the rest of this year, at least, that's for sure. AMH on tour in Mexico City. Anne-Marie, thank you. On tour. Beautiful place. You've been there much? Mexico City? Uh, years and years ago. It's not the same now as a it Great was restaurant then. scene, Tom. Yeah. If you want some recommendations in the future for next time. Thank you. At any time. I want to talk about Lulu, just briefly, before we get into Tom's routine in Mexico Lululemon City. Lululemon or Lulu in Brazil? Lululemon okay. right now. Down by almost 13% if you're just tuning in. Lisa's going to give you some more detail on this in about five or ten minutes' time. But Lisa, the margin story for this company and this company, this stock at least, getting hammered. And that's after they actually reported better than expected earnings. So this is the issue, is that they actually uh, saw demand going up. This isn't a demand question. This is a margin question. This is a cost question, which really raises the issue. When do we start seeing the ramifications of that in the labor market? That's kind of what the Fed's been looking for. Isn't this the story going into earnings season? People are expecting Lululemon to be the norm. That's why you're seeing sort of Nike and Under Armour falling in sympathy. We'll get into all of that. How much, though, is this either sector-specific, industry-specific, where that isn't perhaps a suit going back to the <laughs> office-specific? I don't know. There's a broader story here, Tom. Mike Wilson and Be Morgan careful Stanley. now when you I'm talk a broader there. story. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley thinks we're really underestimating the amount of earnings damage that's going to take place here. 
go I through would, the rest of this year. I, and I defer to the brilliant people we have on that work at this really hard, including Gina Martin Adams. I'm going to go right up the income statement and say some of the gross margin erosion that you see here in uh, Lululemon is is just very simply the revenue dynamic. That's the equity market. We'll throw in the bond market as well. Next up, <clears throat> Mike Schumacher, Global Head of Macro Strategy at Wells Fargo on this program. Looking forward to that after a big move lower in bond yields in Friday's session. We try to bounce here up three basis points. Your 10-year, 358.93. Equity futures positive, four-tenths of 1%. Massive week ahead. Chairman Powell tomorrow, CPI on Thursday, JP Morgan earnings on Friday. Going into it all to kick off things this Monday morning. We look like this on the equity market. Up by 15, 16 points on the S&P. Futures up four tenths of 1%. On the Nasdaq, up a half of 1%. Adding to the gains on Friday. Big moves higher by more than 2% for the session. Erasing a weekly loss and snapping the weekly losing streak we've seen on the equity market. Biggest week. Lee gain top going back to late November on yeah. the S and P after Friday's gains and the jumble of it all, John. And you know, SPX speaks volumes here versus an odd Dow and Nasdaq 100 with its tech bias, is as well. So I'm re I got to rely on the VIX, and the answer is the VIX has been remarkably static in a 21-22 region. But that's what I'm watching. You talk bull market. I need to see a 20. I see the 19 VIX. We're not there we'll yet. We'll pause for that bull market. I'll get to that in just a moment. This move on Friday helped out by this move in the bond market. We had a 20 basis point move on Friday. 20 basis point plus <clears throat> in some parts of the curve. 426.40 on a two-year right now. Yields up by about a basis point. Off the back of not just softer wage growth, but also a softer ISM as well. Now, if you can throw in lower rates, throw in a weaker dollar, and throw in a China reopening story. This is what you get in the end. Stir it all up. It's not a toxic brew. What's, what's the opposite of a toxic brew? Bramo, what do you want to call it? Soft landing. <laughs> is, is that what we're seeing in the end? <laughs> yes. Emerging market no, stocks from the lows of October are up more than 20%, TK. There is your bull market. It's a breakout, and it's on a relative basis, John. You show the MXEF, the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, for those on radio. And what's important here, leg up stasis and now a new leg up. It's all well, news based. But, but is any of this because of a rip roaring recovery in the economy or really just hopes of a soft landing giving some fuel? To Maybe some it's of just the a run from areas. gloom and a run from stasis. Uh, look, you heard from Alessia the longest 30 minutes ago. If you can get this China reopening story, if they can fuel that with wider budget deficits, which is what we're discussing this morning, you can get lower rates. You can get a weaker dollar. This is where people want to be. Whether you want to stay there, that's up to you. But and this yes. is the argument people are making. And Alessio DeLongas is saying perhaps this is more tactical than it is long-term a sure. bet on the developing markets. What people are worried about is some sort of deterioration in profit margins. And that's what we're seeing this morning, or at least the hints of it. Out of uh, Lululemon, we've been talking about the yoga pants for a while now, but for certainly throughout the morning, there is a question here about where some of the margin compression came from. I just want to give you this. The revenue is up between 25 and 27 percent on a year earlier and ahead of the previous target range. So the actual revenue is above expectations, but the margin, uh, the gross margin is expected to contract for the fourth quarter by about one percentage points versus the prior forecast of a widening, an expansion, even though it's small, oh, so an expansion of those profit margins. How much is this an example of what we're going to be seeing more broadly as workers cost more, as the materials cost more, as the rents cost more, everything? Where are these going to go other than in the profit margin? And you're seeing Nike and Under Armour, John, uh, both falling in sympathy. So basically what you're saying is it's not a top line story. It's a bottom line risk. Correct. This is an issue exactly what the Fed was hoping for, was basically something's got to give because at some point, some of these companies cannot pass along the price increases to consumers in order to remain competitive. So they get revenue that's above estimate. They're continuing to sell, but those costs are bleeding into what they can take home. You mentioned the Fed. The next stop for this Fed, Chairman Powell tomorrow, then on to CPI on Thursday. Investors looking for more signs price pressures are fading. Mike Schumacher of Wells Fargo weighing in, saying, quote, in our view, the implied terminal rate will respond about as strongly to a hefty print on core CPI as to a weak one. 
For the two prior months, we figured that a weak print would prompt a bigger market reaction. Tom, just Mike Schumacher there on the balance of risks around how this market will respond to whatever we get on Thursday. Well, this guy that writes holistic notes pulling in the economics into the fixed income space as well. And his recent note, John, I mean, is just extraordinary in its nuance, not only in the United States, but also the transatlantic dynamics as well. People lining up to buy fixed income. Into yes, 23. that's the heart of the matter. That's the heart of the matter. It's the matter. He joins us now, Michael Schumacher, is global head of macro strategy at Wells Fargo with exceptionally acute notes. Mike, your acute note says higher yields. Are we all going to die if we have higher yields? <laughs> I hope not, at least not quickly anyway, Tom. And it's, it's interesting when you think about the move on Friday, I agree it was huge, but still, the bond market has been so choppy, so volatile now for really the past six months. I wouldn't take too much out of one day's move. A lot of events coming up, a lot of progress in inflation, sure. But it's not yet time to signal, hey, it's all clear for bonds. If we sum it all up into the Bloomberg Total Return uh, Index, known over the years at Lehman Brothers and such, the answer is down ginormous with a little bit of a bounce. If you call for higher yields, does the blended total return index seek new lows in price? Yeah, it depends where you look on the curve time. So if you focus on the front end, you probably still get positive returns. Let's say the two-year Treasury, you've got such a high yield baked yeah. in that if yields were to go up 25 or 50 basis points, yes, it matters, but it's not going to knock out that four-plus coupon. In the 10-year area, very different story. A little bit of an uptick, long duration, you're looking at negative returns. How much are you going to expect the market to move to a higher expectation of a terminal Fed funds rate in a very violent manner as they start to realize that the Fed is serious about what they're saying? It's going to take a while, I think, Lisa. And the problem is the Fed's credibility, frankly, is not very good. If you look back a year, so go back to December of 21, take a look at the terminal dot or take a look at the Fed funds dot for 22. At that point, it was less than 1%. That didn't work out at all. So I think the market listens to Chair Powell, says, yeah, he sounds pretty serious. He's been talking tough for four or five months. But let's see how this pans out. Let's see if the Fed hikes in February. Let's see if the Fed hikes in March. The market's going to give the Fed not much credit, frankly, because the forecasts have been so poor. Mike, I got to ask you, because we've been talking about this and kind of questioning how much we have to care about this, not to shift zones outside of uh, Jay Powell, but we've been talking about the debt ceiling debate. And at what point this bond market will care about the potential for a default a la 2011? What's your expectation? Is it on your radar? We're more concerned than we would normally be this far out, simply because of all the, the pandemonium in Washington over the last week. But the market's seen this movie a bunch of times. So typically people in the market don't care about the debt ceiling until three, maybe four weeks before the extraordinary measures appear to be exhausted. And then they care a lot. So they care none, 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 a bunch. And then you see market shift, equities do strange things, T-bill yield spike, that kind of stuff. But we're not there yet. I think it takes a while. Mike, I look at the total return index, and I know that guys like you are dealing in spread and relative uh, yield analysis. Deborah Cunningham was on last week from Federated, and she stopped this show with her caution on it's going to be a clip of coupon year and prices are going to go down. If we breach last year's carnage in the total return index, we go back to a price of 2016. Is that feasible that we could see a second year? of price trauma in bonds? Last year was incredible, Tom. So thinking about the moves in the market relative to where the year began, blowing away forwards, I think that's very tough to imagine. Not impossible because things have been so strange. But think about, let's say, monetary policy for the ECB or the Fed. What's the upper bound we'd put on maybe Fed activity this year, 6 percent, something like that? So. That's much less movement this year than we had last year. For the ECB, maybe it goes 100, 150. Big moves, yes. But again, not really shocking the market as we had a year ago. So I think the idea, or at least hopefully the, the chance of being repeating something like last year in the bond market is pretty small. So you think that this year bonds will offer an offset to the potential risk in uh, higher risk assets in the case of some sort of downturn? I think it's a really interesting point, Lisa, and you think about these correlations between bonds and equities for, let's say, most of the last 10 years, you'd have this case where equities would sell off, bonds would rally, so bonds would provide that ballast. The last year and more recently, it's been, oh, yields are down, this is good for stocks. 
and we had this on Friday too. So we don't have that correlation normalizing quite yet. I think it will, but it's probably going to take another quarter or two is my guess. Hey Mike, great to catch up as always. Interesting calls out there at the moment. Mike Schumacher there of Wells Fargo. To Mike's point, and I think Mike Dada mentioned it a little bit earlier, the equity market responds to lower rates and then the equity market starts to respond to why rates are low. And the second part of the story comes a little bit later. So do you want to buy risk going into sub-50 contractionary readings on manufacturing <coughs> and, and services? Yeah, maybe initially because rates have come in, but after that, you've got to trade bad earnings. Although, how much of the badness is already expected, right? I mean, we hear about the whisper numbers. And I know Tom loves the whisper numbers. But how much is that really uh, going to set the bar pretty low and then have companies jump over that hurdle, particularly in areas like tech? I mean, these are the real questions, or even the banking industry on Friday. So I throw in the Fed call as well. For those of you thinking that maybe this is done, Andrew Hollenhorst of City is saying, no way. He says this, we continue to think Fed concern about loosening financial conditions amidst tightening labor markets imply unappreciated hawkish risk, including a 50 basis point hike on February 1st. He goes on to say, Tom, and this published just seconds ago, this is even more the case after the dramatic decline in Treasury yields just last Friday. Well, yeah, the, the, the move in yields, I think, is part of that parlor game. What I like about what Hollenhorst has done is he was early on this call and he stayed uh, with the call and the nuance of the terminal rate, and I guess we'll hear about that from Powell. There's a Q&A there, isn't there? The risk. Yeah, and so, you know, you you, you got to believe we're going to reframe the Q&A. What I take such issue with, John, is the parlor game of gaming rate cuts. I've never seen this, where we're going up, and I get it, we're gaming up, gaming up you know, measuring going up, a la Anna Wong and Andrew Hollenhorst. Sure. But then I'm supposed to game as well when we come down. Yeah, apparently you meant to price the recovery to the recession we haven't had yet. Tom, if that makes sense. Yeah, the, the, the total return index. I take huge issue with the financial media where they quote yield, 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 and relative yield. Lisa, you're a pro at this. I'm not. But I'm looking at the total return index. If it goes down 6.2%, we breach into new lower price on bonds. It was a bear market in bonds, unlike anything we've seen in modern yeah. history. The issue that I have is people are talking about the Fed, and then we got this better than expected data, deceleration in inflation in Europe, and people cheered. And the ECB came out with a report today saying wage inflation is actually going to probably prompt even more rate hikes. So they're becoming even more hawkish. What's their in light number on wage inflation? Of some Do of their, what, well, just they're, they're just saying that it's going to be uh, bigger than expected. Oh, Price right. gains have exceeded right. their 2% goal for a while, and they're concerned about where that momentum is coming. Core inflation came in above the prior month. Can I, can this, I, again, is really okay. notable and really shrugged off by the market. In New York today, John, and, and I go to the, the, the history of, London, of, of the United Kingdom and, and France, where there's labor unrest, we have two separate groups of nurses striking in the greater five boroughs yeah. of New York this morning. Sort of same thing. This morning. Mount Sinai and another hospital. I'm sorry, I don't have that name here. That's, that's, that's real. It's been a feature of the last year, hasn't it? The return of labor leverage. Labor power. I would say so, but I, 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 how do you run a hospital without nurses? With great difficulty, Tom. Yeah, I'm kidding. Quick, we'll bring management down. <laughs> Jane Foley of Rubber Bank is going to join us very shortly, the head well of timed. FX Strategy. Some big moves here. Euro dollar yep. approaching 107, 106.89, at four tenths of 1%, and China taking down that final barrier to entry. No quarantines now, Tom. Final but barrier then with... But then you've got to find the money with, <laughs> to well, get the they'll flight. Make the, well, come on, they'll print the money. We'll talk to Ms. Foley about that. That's Looking important. Looking forward to that. Can you print the money? Yeah. I think that's what I was suggesting, Yeah, $35,000. <laughs> that's you, what I was expecting. TK got a printer. The Keen bills. 35 k for business class. Is that business or first? What is that? It's business. I don't know. Oh. You know? Well, I thought you checked the prices. I, I, it's business. It's, okay. you know, it's outrageous. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Brazil's President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva is vowing to prosecute rioters who stormed the country's top government institutions on Sunday. The insurrection by thousands of supporters of ex-president Jair Bolsonaro follows months of protests since a conservative leader lost to Lula by a razor-thin margin in an election runoff. Lula is calling for federal intervention. On Capitol Hill, new House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is rallying Republicans with promises to cut spending and strengthen border security. Still, in order to win the position, McCarthy had to give more leverage to the party's right wing. He promised a rule change that would allow a single lawmaker to call for a vote to oust the speaker. 
President Biden has declared a state of emergency in California because of flooding and mudslides caused by heavy rains. Now that clears the way for federal assistance. The state is bracing for another storm beginning today. Five to seven inches of rain are expected, with some mountain areas getting up to 10 inches. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. By the time the Fed is done, they're going to have to raise rates at least to five and a half by the middle of the year, maybe even higher. I think nobody's talking about higher. What if inflation doesn't decline? What if service or wage inflation stays high? We have to get used to an inverted curve all this year, in, in our view. That's the call from Priya Misra of TD. She thinks that rates can go well through 5% and have a little look at 550 over at the Federal Reserve, <clears throat> that the yield curve stays inverted all year and we get a recession in the back half. Is that depressing enough for you or what? Your equity market right now on the S&P 500 looks a little something like this. We advance a half of 1% into Chairman Powell tomorrow, CPI on Thursday, JP Morgan earnings on a Friday. Yields, Tom, are a little bit higher by three basis points, 358.74. Equities up, yields are higher. Euro, just a little bit stronger against the weaker dollar here. Euro dollar, 106.92. And look at crude, 76.40, up 3.6%. You've got China reopening. Talk of wider budget deficits out of China, at least the consideration of doing that. You wonder where crude could go, Tom, through the year ahead. It's going to be interesting to see. And, of course, a lot of the angle here is up to $100 a barrel just as a convenient uh, number. Everybody got that wrong last year. It's about the timing. And, uh, John, I'm going to go as the, the key factor that's got to be China opening. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Tom, without a doubt. And you've said this a million times. I think <clears throat> we all have around this table. This is year three of pandemic economics. Yes. If you well, want to make a fool out of someone, ask them for their year-end oil forecast because oil has a habit of making people look very, very silly. And at some point, Tom, we're going to work out that we've got something very, very wrong on this China reopening story. We are going to shift. I hope Powell addresses this today in his Q&A. We are going to shift from an odd supply side dynamics of economics over to a traditional demand side analysis. We're not there yet. I hope it's that simple. Because on the supply side, when it comes to China, I really don't know if this leads to supply chain relief or further supply side dislocations later well, off the back of a boom in demand. And this is what people have been talking about. When do they start requesting more natural gas imports? When do they start pressuring the prices? CICC research came out and said that actually their chances of starting to import a lot more LNG liquefied natural gas is going down because they're turning to cheaper types of things like coal. Out of Australia. Uh, out of Australia, pipeline gas, domestic production. And <clears> so they <throat> might not even begin to do that, which will not pressure on that front. And we'll have to see. Right now, we are going to go to the deepest part of what we do in equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, always. It is the foreign exchange market. And we do it with Rabobank, with their immense heritage of being on the other side of speculation, making commercial transactions go. Jane Foley holds court at Rabobank. Jane, wonderful to have you here and timely as well. Buried in your note at the bottom is dollar bulls do not give up. Why should the dollar bulls not give up as we see weaker dollar moving into a trend? Well, you know, I think if there ever was a year of a two-handed economist, I think this is going to be the year. There are so many uh, different permutations and combinations, I think, hitting the market. So many different ways you can argue uh, uh, the issues that are at hand. And I think particularly positioning now, I think we've got to look at the events that are before us through the prism of positioning and what we've had in the last few months of, of the year into this year is is the market really selling off and on its long dollar position so <laughs> we're going into these fundamentals <clears throat> with the market no longer right. uh, long dollars and the market very very long euro and that's got to color uh, some of the some of the, the news that we've had particularly i think around the fed you do this differently because of the heritage of your bank. You people do a lot of hedging, a lot of business transactions. Is there a dollar bet on the other side of speculation? Well, you know, that, I, I, that, 
there is yes I, I think the answer to that is 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 yes but i think if we look at the reasons that the the market has been selling off the dollar in the last couple of months and it's it's surrounding you know the attitude towards peak us and of course uh, or peak the fed now the, the fed remains pretty hawkish i think we can argue this uh, both ways you know will the fed cut interest rates this year will it not there's lots of different views out there but this argument is going to look different when the market's no longer long the dollars uh, and and similarly you know if we look at what's been ramping up uh, the, the euro long positions over the last couple of months this is all related to the gas price to less pessimism about the european economic outlook but again the news flow is going to hit differently when the market's already long euros so i think what we're in for is an awful lot of choppy trading as as, as the market reacts to the, the ebb and flow of, of this you know very volatile news flow from now, this position of being not long dollars and very long euros. What's the range then you're looking for? I think the range is going to be large, you know, and I, and I think this is a, a, a new world here. And I, and I would go as far as to say is that the, the low volatility that we had, you know, in, in recent years was the outlier. I think that was a, a function of very cheap money in, in the wake of the, the quantitative easing years. And with that rain back, I think all investors are much more exposed to economic fundamentals. They have to look at economic fundamentals and be more worried about it because money's more expensive. And I think that's going to make a, a much more choppy environment, probably, probably not just this year, last year, but actually in, in years to come uh, and, until perhaps we, we get you know cheaper money again for whatever reason. So I, I think we could be, you know, seeing euro dollar in, you know, one, two to maybe one, eight, one, nine, one, ten. You know, I think we've got a, a lot of choppiness um, to come over the course yeah. of this year. Jane, you raise a lot of really good points. This question of which data this market responds to. We saw uh, softer than expected inflation prints in Europe uh, with inflation coming in more than expected. That on the headline number, but that had to do a lot with the energy prices, not with respect to core inflation. The market didn't respond to that. We see the ECB coming out and saying consistently they are going to hike rates more and that they see potential momentum in inflation. What is the market responding to with the optimism aside from just the strength because of the uh, better than expected outcome with the winter and energy. Well, sometimes the market responds to what it wants to, to respond to. It sees what it wants to see. And actually, right now, it's ignoring some of the hawkishness from both the ECB and from the Fed. And, and, and I think in terms of the European data that we had last week, yes, those headline numbers were coming lower. Yes, they're going to come lower uh, because of uh, lower energy prices and, and because of base, base effects as well in, into the year. But those core numbers were higher. Uh, there is the effect of, of tight labour markets. This does make it an unusual downturn because labour markets across mm -hmm. almost the whole of the OECD are so tight and 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 this does mean that services sector inflation could remain more sticky and and this is what central banks are, are worried about this is why they retain this this hawkish rhetoric uh, and and the warning perhaps right. that the market you know don't get too hyped up on the fact that we're going to be cutting right. interest rates in, in the foreseeable future they may not be we have to wait and see what's your high beta trade em right now i gotta make some money before our uh, arsenal spurs here this weekend jane what's your high beta em pair right now well, we've seen, I know, uh, the, the dollar sell off. We've seen people go shorter on, on the Mexican peso. I think that's probably going to uh, carry on. But, you know, if, if you talk about uh, uh, this, I always put, like to put the Aussie in here because the Aussie traditionally is seen as sort of the high risk um, trade within the G10. And, and actually, that's no longer. Australia's running a, a current account surplus. It's an energy exporter. Uh, the interest rate uh, differentials are much narrower than they used to be. And, and, and I think that means that Australia is no longer going to be seen as, as this sort of uh, high risk currency. And, and I think that one could perform quite well this year. Interesting. Jane, thank you. As always, brilliant. Jane Foley there of <coughs> Rabobank. Tony Dwyer of Canaccord, just publishing moments ago. Give us the recipe. Give us the recipe, the ingredients for a significant rally. Here are three of those ingredients for that recipe. One, the Fed stops tightening and adopts a clear course of accommodation. Two, earnings and or valuations reach depressed levels that reflect recession and it's been broadly priced into risk assets. And three, a historically extreme level of oversold pessimistic tactical conditions. Tom, he says, at this juncture, we have none of the above. So none of the above market for Dwyer. What's important here is he is a congenital bull, and he's really pushing against that right now. Futures, Lisa, up four-tenths of 1%.
again, how long can it last, especially in light of what we saw from Lululemon, Minutes. right? At what point oh, does the tightening on. that we've seen Lululemon start to bleed a, into I, I, some of the earnings and the earnings compression that we're expecting to I see, I don't Tom. agree with individual companies moving this thing around. Lululemon is, is you know, they're, they're doing what they're doing and they're struggling. Isn't Nike, when we Hold saw them like three weeks ago, Hold doing better? They're not struggling. This is the interesting fact. They're actually increasing <laughs> revenues at 27 percent year over year. They're actually doing wonderfully the problem is the margins. The actual profit is coming in because of the expenses that they're not passing along to consumers. This is the issue. Can you get a better economy and worse earnings from companies? This is sort of <clears throat> the inverse of what we've seen over the past decade. When Bramo says, hold on a second, TK, you know you're in trouble. No, it's God not in right. trouble. Um, it's, it's when it's the just... hands start going. <laughs> You know, that's, that's why right. you're between us. Hands, <laughs> Horton's hands are worse. Horton looks like she's landing hey, a mate. plane at National. But, you know. At Mexico City. You know, beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Coming up, Vishy Tirupatur, the Global Director of oh, Fixed HR Income Research at Morgan Stanley. <laughs> Vishy's going to join us shortly <laughs> with a little look at the bond market after a massive rally on Friday off the back of some weak data. You know. Equity futures, Tom. Up about 17 I'm points on the Elastic is my waist. The license to train joggers is $128. I paid 10 bucks more. Is that how much it is? Yeah. Did you buy some? Yeah. Are you wearing them now? No. <laughs> <laughs>
just last week, right? And he basically said, we're getting closer. And everyone said, well, he's dovish. We're getting closer to sufficiently restrictive. Do they know where sufficiently restrictive actually is? The ECB is no. saying the same thing. I mean, for a lot of people, we might have been there 100 basis points ago. We might not be there yet in the minds of others. I think Lori Cavasina actually said the dirty secret out loud uh, in her note, where she basically said she's surprised at some of the questions that have nothing to do with inflation, that have nothing to do with the Fed. People are looking for anything other than that to talk about because they're sick of it. And economists came sure. out over the weekend and said, we have no idea. We've been terrible with inflation. So perhaps people are throwing up their hands and trading on what they want to do and seeing what they want to see. Just to get out front of this, in the importance of Thursday, on the 18th, I don't believe we've mentioned, is retail retail sales, the state of the American consumer, which folds into that GDP guess as well. I mean, those are the two signposts along the way. Well, let's add to Friday. This is what the equity boards want, right? They want unemployment at 3.5 percent. They want growth resilient and they want inflation pressures to, to soften. Now, the question we've got to ask <clears throat> after Friday, is it sustainable to expect wage growth to decelerate and unemployment not to climb? And that was what was unique about that report that we saw on Friday. Unemployment dropped to 3.5 and wage growth softened. Can that continue? A lot of people are hoping it can. That screams soft landing if it can. But it's way too early to make that call with any confidence. What happens to margins, though, in that kind of picture? Can you get a perfect soft landing and still see stocks do poorly because margins end up compressing? Sure, there's a massive difference. At yeah. least you've said it a million times. There's a huge difference between what the market does and... Well, the economy does, Tom, and we've seen that several ways I, over the last few years. I'm going to focus on the data. I'm going to go to data dependency, which I'm sure is what Vichy is going to tell us in a moment. Speaking of data, John, let's do it. We had oil up $81 a barrel, Brent crude, a 3% move in oil. But I guess the story this morning is the resiliency we see in equities. And euro dollar, hello, 107, a little yes. bit earlier. That's the high of the session, 106.92, right now up four or five tenths of a 1%. Equity futures up a third of 1%, just a monster rally on Friday, up by more than 2% on the session. On the week up by about 1.5. Biggest weekly gain on the S&P going back to late November. And you can say thank you, not to the payrolls report, say thank you to the ISM reading. That survey was just dreadful. ISM services index dropped seven points. So that's the biggest drop that's we've seen key. since the start Rate of, of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. The reading was 49.6, the lowest since 2020. Business activity, orders dropped the most since 2020. And yields fell off a cliff off the back of that. Tom, so it wasn't just about payrolls. I would say it was hardly about payrolls at all. It was all off the back of that ISM at 10 Eastern on Friday morning. I'll go with that. Right now, we're going to get a further guidance here from the depth of the fixed income market. Vishy Terrapateur joins us, Global Director of Fixed Income Research at Morgan Stanley. Vishy, when you and Mike Wilson sit down, he's on the equity side, you're on the bond side. You guys have the mother of all fractious debates. That's the heritage. Where are you and Mike Wilson most on the same page right now? I, I think um, uh, John just uh, hit, it, uh, hit the nail on the head. Uh, I think the most important data point on Friday, this is what Mike and I talked about, uh, is that the was not really so much the payroll data. Uh, payroll data was informative. Uh, the most imp interesting thing being the average early earnings uh, coming down below, ex coming up below expectations. But the most important data was the ISM data. The ISM data, uh, both new orders, um, new order indices for services and manufacturing significantly below 50. This suggests a, a broad-based contraction in demand for goods and services. And this is very much the point that both Mike and I um, see the economy slowing significantly. Uh, you know, the really the, the in terms of the Fed. Uh, outlook here is whether our, our economists have Fed going um, uh, to uh, you know uh, 4, 450, 475 uh, target price range uh, and, and stopping there. Uh, and I think the most important thing, whether they do that or another 25 basis point more, uh, it, it is really not that important to me. What is important to me is how long they stay there how long they uh, stay in a very restrictive manner to the, uh, and, and that's what is consequential. And this is again a point that Mike and I agree, is that the, the what Fed is indicating is that they are willing to put up with a lot of pain and some of the data from the, the payroll data gave us, gives us gives them additional impetus to, to stay elevated and much longer and at the risk of significant slowing in the economy, and um, and that's the, that's the outlook we are looking at. So Vishy, with that in mind, we hear from Chairman Powell tomorrow. How do you expect him to acknowledge, at least respond to the survey data we've seen so far? I, I expect that he would acknowledge that the, uh, the you know, the 
inflation uh, is um, heading um, south. That's uh, you, you would, you, there's plenty of information to show that. You also uh, see that uh, you know if there's some slowing of the economy. There's significant uh, indications to that front as well. So this is what I expect him to say that we want to accomplish slowing of the economy and uh, bringing uh, the pace of inflation down. And he would I, and that this is going along the lines that they have been calling for. Do you think that the rally has gotten overdone in the long end so far this year? I, I think you know we uh, we made a big call. Um, um, my our interest rate strategy team made a call of going long the five year point. So why we think we think it's time to go long the five year point uh, in the curve. It I think the trade works whether we are have a soft landing as people hope for or a hard landing in both those uh, uh, you know in, under both those circumstances. I think being long the five year treasury works. I think the overall point being that if we have a significant um, uh, you know, economic slowdown and the show shock in earnings recession. Uh, it's bad for Mike's, Mike Wilson's view of the world. Uh, it's bad for uh, uh, equity earnings and that, that lines up with his view of the world. And at the same time, um, the probability that the Fed would be looking to cut at some point uh, would start to getting priced into the market. And that bodes well for the fixed income markets. So all of that comes back to this year being the year of fixed income. With that said, a lot of people are piling into this consensus trade of long investment grade bonds. Some people saying that it's going to perform better than both equities and any kind of currency pair that you could get. Are you piling on that train? We, we uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say we piled on. I think the rest of the world is piling on to our trade. Uh, we've been uh, um, early to call for. <laughs> uh, we've been early to call for um, uh, for high quality credit as the the trade to be in. Uh, we continue to stick by that trade. Vishy, I love you. It's great to catch up. Vishy Tarifatu <laughs> of Morgan Stanley. Love that. I mean, he's right. I mean, you told me months ago the same thing, but it's always funny when they say, no, 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 my trade, we were first. <laughs> Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley probably feels the same coming yes. into 23. My trade, I was first. It's going to be a bad year ahead. This is what Mike's got to say if you're just tuning in. More downside ahead. He said to us a number of weeks ago he thinks the downside could be as much as 20% plus. In fact, I think it was just last week we caught up with him when he said that. This morning, he wrote the following with the team at Morgan Stanley just to start the week. With both the sell and buy side, consensus so aligned. What he's talking about here is this massive dip expected in 23 and then this recovery trade in the back half. Everyone is starting to wonder how this view could be wrong. He goes on to say, we think it's in the magnitude of the move lower led by much weaker earnings and a Fed committed to fighting inflation. And for that reason, I'm not sure if anything's ever an easy sell or an easy buy, but he thinks 3900 Lisa, is an easy sale. And this, to me, is the most interesting part of his call. It's not the direction. It's the scope, the potential for the downturn that is most interesting. ZK? I, I'm going to say that the market is fragmented into the zombies, the less profitables, which is the margin erosion you're talking about, in a select group that probably will go through all of this without, you know, breaking a sweat. But the heart of the matter is, a, is the inflation call. And that's why Thursday is so important. Massive. You get a disinflationary trend down to whatever level you want to talk. That's the elephant in the room for, you know, that's the key part of the equation. You know who's said. taking Thursday off? <clears throat> I, Lisa. Why would I not? You just know, just retiring. My, early. It's my day. Very early to take vacation. You know, yeah, she's, she she said, can I have you your days, this? Tom? And Seriously. I said, yeah, I have no life, so why not? She just screamed at me. I'm going skiing. I don't care what you've <laughs> asked. It's well, okay. Got, go I skiing. Got, I evidently, do. there are tickets that are cheaper than $35,000 <laughs> to travel one way. Good for you, Lisa. <laughs> thanks, you. Thanks, if anyone deserves it, you do. Thanks. You was up three or four basis points on a 10 year, 359.30. Your equity market higher by a third of 1%. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The capital of Brazil is recovering from an insurrection by thousands of supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro. Now, rioters ransacked Congress, the presidential palace, and the top court in Brasilia on Sunday. It took hours for security forces to regain control. New president, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, is vowing to prosecute those rioters. President Biden is in Mexico, where he'll meet with the leaders of, the Mex of Mexico and Canada. Now, that summit is aimed at easing tensions over migration and drug smuggling. President Biden faces continuing political pressure over a surge of unauthorized migrants from Latin America. The European Central Bank is strengthening the case for more interest rate hikes. 
It predicts that wage growth, a key indicator of where inflation is headed, will be very strong in the coming months. The ECB says that reflects robust labor markets that haven't been substantially affected by the slowing of the economy. In New York City, more than 7,000 nurses at two major hospitals went on strike today. The nurses at Mount Sinai and Montefiore say that staffing levels at private sector facilities are inadequate and that pay should be higher. The pandemic led to the high turnover, and that forced hospitals to fill gaps with expensive travel nurses and push their margins negative. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I think that the Fed is imposing a severe slowing on the economy, and then the recovery from that will be stronger. So there will be cyclical leadership again, uh, but we still haven't felt all of this in the economy yet. We will probably see that recovery within 2023, but not soon. That is the dip in the first half, the rip in the second half, and a consensus view there from Steve Whiting, the chief investment strategist and chief economist at City Global Wealth Management. I'm sure he won't appreciate being consensus, but ultimately <laughs> for 2023, it's kind of consensus. Equity futures right now on the S&P uh, by a third of 1%. Futures rallying here off the back of gains on Friday. We build on that. Yields trying to bounce back from an aggressive move lower in Friday's session following payrolls and the negative survey <clears throat> reading on services in America. That ISM sub-50, a big drop from the previous month. Yields up by three basis points, 387.74. And as China dismantles COVID zero, crewed up by more than 3% here, Tom, 76.25. Yeah. Brent with an 81 handle. Nice pop. As Lisa mentioned, we're done saying Happy New Year. It's over. And part of it at Bloomberg is a heritage of our international uh, coverage. It's been with us. We mentioned the 30th anniversary of Bloomberg Radio and TV here uh, last week. And what that means is we parachute in worldwide almost to 100 of our executive editors and key staff who make Bloomberg surveillance go. Their people are what inform us each and every day. This morning's chosen victim is Will Kennedy. He's senior executive editor for Energy and Commodities. <laughs> Wanted to start his day at the crack of 10 a.m., and he came in at 8.17. It's a little later London time. I don't feel sorry for you as, as well. China reopening means new demand. Do we know demand, elasticity, responsiveness in hydrocarbons? Or are you guys guessing as you go? We don't know in China. I think it's the important question this year. Clearly, the in the big cities, the worst of the first wave is over, and people are trying to think what that looks like. We got some interesting news out of China today. Five refiners uh, get quotas from the state about how much oil uh, they can import. They just got a very big one. So those quotas are running 20% ahead of where they were. They're bringing in 20% more they're than saying what they, you thought. They're saying the refiners can import 20% more if they want, which I think is a signal that the government expects right. a big jump in demand. How big? We don't know. But clearly we know from reopenings uh, a year or two ago in other parts of the world that once this happens, people really want to fly again and they want to drive again and they want to see relatives again. And you've got the Chinese New Year coming up and I think people will be really be watching how busy those airports and, and roads are. And after three years of lockdown, there's going to be, you would well, think, a lot of pent up demand. Perhaps. But where that demand gets filled is the question, right? Because is it going to come from natural gas, from crude, from some of the supplies that the rest of the world have been trying to tap into? Or is this going to come from coal, from gas and from uh, and from oil in Australia, as some people are suggesting, cheaper sources of energy? When you talk about China and energy, I think the answer over the years has always been all of it. <laughs> they need lots of energy, and I think that means, to different degrees, uh, more of all that energy. I do think, though, when it comes to crude, that's what, uh, you know, when it comes to people flying again, driving again, that has to be crude oil. Um, the gas question is very important for the global market. Clearly, their gas imports have been uh, depressed uh, over the last few years, and that's one of the reasons why the energy crunch has not been as bad as some people feared in Europe. If they start importing the LNG again on a on a serious scale, that could uh, quickly end some of the uh, softer gas prices that we've seen in other parts of the world. But I don't I don't think that's clear. And of course, the win end of winter is in sight in in all of the northern hemisphere, including China.
I'm, I'm pretty surprised as I start reading through the situation in Europe and the situation, the questions around China. In Europe, they're getting more imports of natural gas than they want at this point. Yeah. They're getting more deliveries. How long can this dynamic last? Is it more driven by demand side or by supply side coming and meeting uh, some of the demand? Uh, Europe's caught a lucky break with the weather. I think it's really that's the biggest part of it. It's been an exceptionally warm start to the year and it was a pretty mild uh, first half of the winter last year. And that's really suppressed demand c combined with energy saving measures, combined with a lot of factories uh, shutting down and cutting production. Uh, Europe is in a much better place than it expected to be. And that gas has already been ordered. Uh, those stockpiles are much more full than people expected. 91% full in Germany, much higher stockpiles than you would typically see in a winter. Uh, and that's right. That means the cargoes are coming in now are, you know, not really needed. And that is as depressing prices. The summer will matter. I don't think people should be complacent. They're going to have to refill stockpiles without any Russian gas at all, more or less this year. Uh, that's going to be hard to do. And a cold snap at the end of this winter, a start to a cold start to next winter, it could change. Has any of this changed the investment decisions of the Exxons, the Shells, the BPs, the Chevrons of this world? At the margin, perhaps. I mean, we saw a pretty big number out of BP for how much they're going to invest in the US uh, next year. Some of that was due to an acquisition. And of course, we've got very high inflation in the industry, which skews the figures. But I don't think we've seen any wholesale investment. It will be very interesting to see what gas projects get invested in, both in the US this year, what contracts get signed for gas export in the US this year, which will allow people to develop more LNG export terminals, or if we get any new projects in places like Africa. Um, we might see it in gas. I think oil is a lot less, you know, investment seems to remain very depressed, suppressed. Do you get the sense that the Europeans have changed their mind on anything over the last 20 months, given the experience of the last I year? I think that European politicians would be happy to see gas investments in the US, in Africa, in a way that they probably weren't <coughs> thinking about a year ago. They're not going to shout about it from the rooftops. But when I was in COP27 in Egypt, there was a lot of controversy about the German chancellor sort of on the one hand saying you've got to be net zero, on the other hand, talking to African governments about whether they'd like to sell him any gas. So I do think there has been a subtle shift. John, I don't think people will be shouting it from the rooftops. So. Are you going to be able to get back in time to see Tottenham Arsenal? Are you, are you, the you the question, Tom, is do I want to? <laughs> yeah. that, I mean, that's really what matters. And Tom's basically John, asking, can John, he come with you? Yeah, yes, yeah. John and I are trying to get there. Over as to yeah. Yeah. No, I will. I will be back early on Saturday just in time to see uh, Tottenham win against the odds, I think, Tom. Okay. Have you checked see, ticket prices? Well, yeah, I call them up and they've been extremely I looked at some of the Arsenal tickets in a couple of weeks' time and completely sold out. Yeah. Completely. You can't get them. And my friends who are members there just saying that to get tickets for Arsenal this year, given how well they're doing in the league, it's just almost impossible. I was thunderstruck on my last visit there, the number of Arsenal fans I ran into. I mean, they're, they're huge. We just don't have that developed secondary market in the UK for, for the Premier and all League. That. Yeah, yeah they, it keep really it, works. they try and keep it in house. Yeah. amongst the membership mm -hmm. in a way that I think, you know, in the US, if there's a big game and you've got the yeah. money, there's a price. Whereas in the UK, it's a little but, bit more difficult. Uh, well, since we got here, what's Javier Blas thinking about? I mean, he, he's such a star for us writing for Bloomberg Opinion. What When you talk to Javier, what's he fulminating about? I think that he uh, would admit that the energy crunch hasn't been quite as severe as some people predicted because mm -hmm. of the weather. But I think he would tell you that it's not over yet, that next right. winter looks Which is what bad. we're hearing. Yeah. I think yeah. Javier has been phenomenal, yeah. just highlighting yeah. the hypocrisy of, of politicians. And, and we'll mention that some of these politicians won't be shouting about it from the rooftops, but maybe yeah. let's not follow the rhetoric <clears throat> and just follow the decisions. The decisions yeah. have certainly changed, Will, you in a big to, way. Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing that's worth watching this year is metals. We've seen a big pop in metals, and that's the other market that may really benefit from a Chinese yeah. reopening and a Chinese investment. And stocks are very, very low. So that's, right. you know, you're talking a lot today about softening inflation, but and commodity prices <clears throat> have softened. But I do think there are areas right. where commodity prices could come back sharply. So, Copper, do you look at LME or do you look at Chicago Copper? Which price do you use? I think most people still look at the LME price. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. And there's no home bias there, but of course, <laughs> yeah. on the same page. Will, this is special. With us all week. This was so good. Can you come thank back you. tomorrow? Ah, we'll course. slot you right. We'll any, talk to anytime. our people. We'll talk to your people. Thank you, Tom. Will Kennedy, thank you. <laughs> Out of London, just a phenomenal <clears throat> commodities team. 
Eric this is the I mean, history, we say that so you know, many times, but truly it is. In the intro, I mentioned the executive editors, and this goes back to a guy named Stuart Wallace and Justin Kerrigan, and we made a commitment, and Mr. Winkler made a commitment years ago, that we were going to own this up against John really good competitors. Commodities are a, Americans don't know this. It's a world business. And, you know, the, the fallout of 10 and 15 years of investment is to have a team that, you know, I mean, Javier is visible, but there's a whole bunch of other people grinding away at this. For much of last year, day. it was the story. Yeah. The story. Crude right now, Brent, up to <clears throat> about $81 a barrel, up by more than 3% on Brent. Chicago, right? WTI up by 3.2%, 3.3% higher to $76 and about 20 cents. I met Will at the Dorchester, the miners' convention. They yeah, Alamy Week. Yeah, he looked at me and says, Tom, you don't want to put an umbrella in your we'll, drink. Will we be the, the first to tell you that Alamy Week has changed a lot over the last yeah. five to ten years? It's not, it what it, not what it once was. Coming up, Christian Mamani of Lafayette College in the next hour. Looking forward to speaking to him and Marilyn Watson of Blackrock and Dan Suzuki of Richard Bernstein Advisors as we count you down to the opening bell in America. Bloomberg Surveillance, we say good morning to you. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keen here. An eventful Monday morning, and of course, Steel, there's Sri Natarajan to join us here uh, in a bit on an important day for Goldman Sachs. We welcome all of you of Global Wall Street uh, this morning. He'll be joining us here in about 10, 12 uh, minutes as we look at a set of anticipated layoffs at, uh, at Goldman Sachs, I should say, and we'll follow up on that um, as we uh, can. Uh, right now, we've got futures up 20, Dow futures up 121. The VIX, uh, somewhat stable here, 21, 22 level. Don't want to make much of it. There is an equity lift, but it's accompanied with a pullback here. Higher yields this morning off the huge lower yield movement that we saw on Friday. 210 spread 67 uh, basis points. And in the foreign exchange market, dollar gives it up a little bit here. I should point out yuan off the China news, 6.78 on uh, Chinese uh, yuan. Right now, on the economy, on what we saw on Friday and the adjustment forward, she is with ADP, Automatic Data Processing, is without question most locked into our paychecks of any company in the country. She's their chief economist. Neela Richardson adds value. Neela, good morning to you. Um, Neela, I, I, I really want to focus in here on what ADP sees, not your proprietary stuff, I don't need the state secrets, but with the advantage of your payroll knowledge, what did you learn Friday and how does it amend your view forward? Well, we, we learned that our firms, our clients, over a million clients are still hiring rather aggressively. We also learned that that hiring intensity is coming from small and medium firms that were blocked out through a lot of the hiring in 2022, outmanned by larger firms when it came to benefits and wages. And then the third thing we learned, and I think this is really important when you talk about the next steps for the Fed, is that wages are moderating. They are. Um, but they're not moderating quickly enough to make even a 2% inflation target seem reasonable at this point. They're still quite high, almost double what they were going into the pandemic. Right. So there's still a lot of work to do when it comes to wages and getting them down to a tolerable uh, pace of growth that meets the Fed target. The economist John Farrow has really emphasized the ISM numbers on Friday as well. They show some sogginess. How does Neela Richardson to find a soft landing. I have trouble with that phrase, but if we don't like the phrase soft landing, where are we going with that optimistic outcome? Well, to me, a soft landing is a landing you can walk away from. And I think the economy is strong enough right now, at least it looks like that it'll do so. We pretty much got a Goldilocks report on the 6th. Um, and I'm gonna say more about that in a second, but we got a report where you still saw a strong jobs growth and moderating wage growth. That's like the perfect scenario for a soft landing. The question is, will that trend continue? And I think what people get wrong about the current state of the labor market is that all of this is cyclical, that it can be controlled by a slightly higher interest rate. Much of what we're seeing in the labor mar market right now is structural. And if you look at the hard data, you'll see that employment growth over the next decade is expected to be half 
of what it was the previous decade. That means labor shortages are persistent, and the specter of higher wages, especially in the service sector, will be with us for some time to come. So in other words, Neela, if I were going to sort of put a bow on that, are you basically saying that hope of a soft landing based on the print that we got on Friday is perhaps more wish than reality? I'm saying that the door's still open, actually, but that door swings both ways. Uh, we still have a robust labor market, 3.5% unemployment rate. I mean, there's no getting around that. That's a strong labor market. And you're seeing uh, initial jobless claims barely above 200,000. That's a really strong labor market. <laughs> However, that's a labor market that's also at risk of higher wage pressure at every turn. So this idea that the Fed can just get to this terminal rate and then pivot, to me, that door is closed. Uh, where you, I expect to see federal funds rates higher for longer for some time to come because the labor shortages aspect of the labor market isn't going away. Well, people will point to the services ISM, which you mentioned, that was weaker than expected, that came in with contractionary territory, and then areas like the housing market that have seen incredible destruction in terms of how much prices have come down, perhaps not that significant, but certainly the volume of sales. How much more is there to go in some of the industries that have been first hit by some of the tightening uh, Fed funds rate? Well, let me point out that the housing, the issue with housing is more structural than it is cyclical. It's not just higher mortgage rates. People have bought housing at much higher mortgage rates than what we're seeing now. It's about the monthly payment. Uh, what we're seeing in housing is just the lack of inventory, and that hits at a supply issue that is been an issue for over a decade. And that supply issue is likely to get worse with higher interest rates. So that's something that is structural. The 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 but to get back to your question, um, we can't expect the labor market to behave in a uniform way. This is a very fragmented market. And so you're seeing interest rate sensitive sectors like manufacturing start to slow. We've seen that firms that overhired last year, like information technology, they're starting to pause and slow. But at the same time, when one door closes, another door opens. You see that in the JOLTS data. There's still a lot of job openings and there are firms waiting in line to scoop up that headcount right now in this very tight labor market. Well, that's where I wanted to go. Let, let, I mean, I don't know if you've got any interior knowledge on this, Neela, but let's go there with all the bias you have in excellence with ADP. There's this tech hemorrhage going on right now. Do those people find jobs? It, it's too, too soon to tell how quickly they find jobs. And I think that underlies your question, how quickly they find jobs. We don't expect them to be part of the long-term unemployed of six months or more uh, that you see in, a, in other parts, other segments of the population. But it's how quickly they are observed. And my feeling and is that those skills are readily observed, absorbed, not necessarily in tech, but in other uh, sectors of the economy that benefit from advanced uh, tech and data skills and software development. Some of these uh, technologies that were really important during the pandemic have now gone mainstream, and companies are more likely to need tech talent in the future than less. So I, I expect that these uh, numbers will be quickly absorbed, though it's highly disruptive for people in the short term. <clears throat> I mean, this is really, really important. And, and Lisa, would you agree with me? This is in the zeitgeist that, that there's a lot of carnage going on in technology, but I'm sorry, there's an American job economy out there. Maybe maybe on a, on a stock basis or the hopes of a tech stock boom, you don't make the same compensation, but it's not like they're going out into a nothingness. Which is the reason why we haven't necessarily seen it in some of those numbers. Neela, this really raises a question. At what point do we start to see the destruction in the numbers that we're seeing in certain industries? Are we ever going to see it? Could we see a recession without necessarily an unemployment rate that picks up all that much? If we do, Lisa, it will be the weirdest recession in U.S. history. I mean, I start from first principles, the jobless claims numbers. Those numbers are super low. And then I add the unemployment rate, 50-year low. And then I see the robust hiring. And yes, there could be some softness next year, and we could see weaker hiring next year. But the fact that firms are still hiring, when all expectation is that the economy is slowing, slowing significantly uh, from last year and definitely from 2021, that means makes the hiring even more remarkable. It tells me that what we're seeing is uh, impervious to interest rate hikes, that there's something more going on and that 
companies still need to hire and find qualified talent. So, Neela, just to sort of wrap this all up, you said that you think that this ultimately will push the Fed to raise rates to a higher level for longer and keep it there for longer than people currently are expecting. Can you give us some parameters of what you're expecting and when it will be felt by an economy that still has been resilient? Yeah, I don't know if the Fed's path is through the labor market. I know the narrative is that if we can cripple the labor market, we can slow down hiring, we can spike up the unemployment rate, and that we can crush wage pressures, that's going to lead to lower inflation. Um, I'm not sure that's the path anymore. Uh, I think what we need, actually, is to see more people enter the labor market. And unfortunately, what that means from, for the Fed is that it's not just a monetary response, it's a fiscal response. It's a jobs retraining response. It's a get people into those interviews response, which needs more federal and local support, not just monetary support. So the idea that the Fed can do this alone and fix the labor market, bring down inflation and get people back uh, into the labor market is, I think, a little idealistic. So the Fed can only stay in its lane. Uh, I would expect to see a federal funds rate over 5%, and I would expect them to hold there for quite a bit of time. That means through 2023. Neela, thank you so much. A brief from Neela Richardson of ADP uh, this morning. I want to turn to Global Wall Street right now. Sri Natarajan to join us here. On, at least as we mentioned with Shanali Basak earlier, the anticipation of I guess, normal January change at Goldman Sachs. Calling of this herd, basically, as uh, they return to something more normal <clears throat> after not laying people off dur during the pandemic, both because right. it didn't look good to lay people off, but also because they were going gangbusters in the face of easing monetary policy. In, in another story, at Kennecord Genuity, we mentioned Tony Dwyer, their strategist who's with us a lot. Kennecord Genuity is Western Canada. I know them from their, their acquisition of Adam... Uh, Harkness and Hill, I believe it was, out of Boston uh, years ago. Maybe that's where Dwyer came from. I can't remember. Right, and it's ancient history. I mean, this goes back 40 years with Tony. But Kanegar Genuity is so upset with their stock price, they want to take it in private. And it goes to the zombie roll-up. Not to say that Kanegar Genuity is a zombie, but their senior manager just thinks the stock price is unacceptable. Although, so there's a lot of turn And Jeffrey's this afternoon, I should point out. Although we haven't necessarily seen the huge amount of corporate buybacks that many people were expecting, which has been a big question mark. When are we going to actually end up seeing that? And so, again, how much is this push-pull going to take place? Can I just say one thing about what Neil Richardson was saying there? Please. Because we've been asking about the potential for a debt ceiling debate, what the turmoil in Washington, what the effects would be. And there, Neil was saying that ultimately the potential for growth and actually decelerating inflation comes from that fifth fiscal response from retraining employees from perhaps but you know more targeted uh, immigration policies that probably won't get done if we take, and this is where I'm extrapolating out, if you're looking at some of the uh, gridlock in D.C. I'm going to look at the data. I, I go back to this and, you know, I, I, I really... I, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, Jane Foley. I, I, Jane Foley, I thought, was brilliant on the volatility we're all living day to day. And for me, all you can then do is fall back on the data, and the ECO screen becomes the most important tool that I have going forward. The problem is it's a choose-your-own-adventure eco screen. It's a choose-your-own-adventure number of data points that you can basically frame in whichever way you want because there's something for everyone. So that's where it gets complicated. When does it become a trend? We won't know until it might be too late, which is the well, same story for the Fed. For Global Wall Street, stay with us. Sri Natarajan, I believe, to join us next. Future's up a buoyant 22. We're buoyed or? We're buoyed. We We're can buoyed. say buoyed. We're buoyed. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Brazil's President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva is vowing to prosecute rioters who stormed the country's top government institutions on Sunday. The insurrection by thousands of supporters of ex-president Jair Bolsonaro follows months of protests since a conservative leader lost to Lula by a razor-thin margin in an election runoff. Lula is calling for federal intervention. President Biden has declared a state of emergency in California because of flooding and mudslides caused by heavy rains. That clears a way for federal financial assistance. The state is bracing for another storm beginning today. Five to seven inches of rain are expected, with some mountain areas getting up to 10 inches. Richard Branson's Virgin Orbit says it's on track for Britain's first ever space launch tonight. Now, the takeoff of a modified Boeing 747 jetliner with a rocket under its wing is planned between 9.40 and 11 p.m. 
The mission will deploy nine satellites for a range of customers. And Deere has reached a deal with the American Farm Bureau Federation to allow farmers and their ranchers to repair their own equipment. The agreement gives farmers access to diagnostic and repair codes, as well as manuals and product guides. Now, it also allows them to buy tools directly from Deere and get help from the company when placing orders. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. This is a, a, a market that is, is uh, split between kind of soft landing and hard landing scenarios, uh, but where the consensus expectation around declining inflation you know, leads the ability for the Fed to pivot. Jeffrey Rosenberg, portfolio manager at BlackRock, uh, there with a chat on the jobs report and then on to the ISM number, which was grim. Uh, not grim, but d difficult, I'll say, on Friday. And that gives us the up equity market that we saw Friday, and it continues today. Futures up 20, Dow futures up 118 as well. But we're going to do three things here. We're going to get the Srinataraj in here on Goldman Sachs and on a January for Wall Street. Uh, but, Lisa, there's a headline of a war that just won't go away. Moments ago, the United Kingdom considering sending battle tanks to Ukraine. They joined Germany yeah. in analysis, France, and, of course, the United States. Trench warfare. Some people describe it as that, basically, the akin to it in 2023. And the effort to try to support Ukrainian troops, there was a story in The New York Times over the weekend that I thought was interesting about how others who have a, a gripe to uh, against Russia are joining the fight in Ukraine, that there are troops coming in from other, from other areas. Yeah, exactly, to try to, to support yeah. uh, the fight. So we right. shall see as we enter into a colder period. Battle tanks needed, perhaps a Goldman Sachs as well. Sri Natarajan joins us here on uh, the uniqueness of this moment for Goldman Sachs. Cut to the chase. Is this about dumb decisions in doing specs, et cetera, et cetera? Is it about the bank, the Marcus, and all the rest of it? What's the backstory leading to 3,000 plus? layoffs today. Uh, th Fires. That certainly will be a touch harsh, Tom. Yes, what Goldman Sachs is doing is going deeper than rivals. It is shedding jobs and what any of the other banks have planned as of now. But it is really hard to pin it down just on mistakes. The consumer banking foray has not gone great, and they have outlined a retreat there. However, you also have to look at the fact that through the pandemic, they didn't do the usual cut of underperformers as usual. Right, Lisa mentioned. And they've yeah. had a big jump in headcount. Under David Solomon, you've seen headcount increase 34% since the end of 2018 to almost 50,000 employees mm -hmm. now. So... While they are planning 3,200 cuts, that works out to about 6.5%. <clears throat> but just in right. terms of sheer numbers, it is one of the biggest exercises Goldman has ever carried out in terms of job cuts. I'm showing my vintage, but does the leader have the partnership support? I, partnership might complain and grumble about a variety of things, but you're emerging from a very difficult 2022 where the Goldman Sachs stock, even though it was down about 10%, it was still a better performer than almost all the other banks. Mm -hmm. It just pipped Morgan Stanley towards the end of the year and definitely way bigger than the bigger consumer banks heading into 2023. So if you have a lot of complaints at this moment, it feels a little misdirected if it is all targeted at David Solomon. A lot of people have seen the job cuts as a positive. It's certainly a if they're an equity investor, they see this as uh, perhaps trimming some of the expenses in a positive way. Will it be received that way after next Tuesday? Will the earnings bear out that this is really a good exercise to prepare for perhaps a leaner future? The earnings will definitely show you why they needed to do something like this. They have set return on equity targets. They're not going to meet that for the year 2022. They're barely going to tread water on the 10% mark. Their target is somewhere in the 14 to 16% mark. And of course, they will say, we do not judge that on a year-to-year -year basis, but shareholders and investors don't necessarily look at the long term, even though they would like to think that's what they do. They look in the now, and when the numbers don't match, they want to see management taking some action. And that is why you see them going ahead and saying, 
We are tackling the uncertain environment we're heading into. We're tackling the ballooning expenses with this measure. We already know that deal making has been slow. We've seen investment banking slow in terms of profits. We talked about the SPACs no longer. The easy money, uh, I hate that phrase, but here we are, uh, not necessarily there. But how much is this also because of, for example, loans that have remained on the books that had to do with mergers and acquisitions that were made during a better time and now having to accept losses? How much is due to just turmoil in the market gone awry in specific portfolios? There are certainly industry-wide trends that Goldman is not immune to. You've had a big decline in investment banking fees. Let's not forget asset management. You've had a big decline in asset prices. And a year ago, that was a massive boost for Goldman Sachs. Th that helped them increase their revenue that year by 8 to $9 billion just because of price gains in asset prices. That gain is not going to be there this year. So when you lose such a big chunk and you have mm -hmm. this little consumer banking experiment, the new division that they're going to unveil, which will have losses, or at least pre-tax losses, that will show as more than $2 billion. It might be a bit of an accounting kirk, but it is still more <laughs> than $2 billion. It's still a problem. Tom, did you like how he did that? He called Marcus that little consumer banking experiment. He's so smooth. I, mean, <laughs> I love Sri. Like, lights out. What are the 3,200, the 3,800, whatever the count is people do? They're going to go out. They're going to have parchment, a resume that says they worked at Goldman. Is it like they get a job right away? I mean, what's, is there pixie dust involved here? Or is this going to be a HR slog for these people? Look, that's the hard part here. We're all talking about how investors will react, how shareholders will react. Yeah. But this is also, at the end of the day, a very human process. You have going to have 3,200 people who are going to go out into a very difficult 2023, into a very difficult job market, even though they say there is a war for talent. It is hard to imagine other banks. They might not be cutting as many jobs as Goldman Sachs, but they are still not going to be out there hiring aggressively. I will point out one thing, though, and this is important. As bad as the number is, and as hard as it is to say there is a little bit of good news here, there is a little bit of good news here, because just a few weeks back, management ranks were talking about cuts that could be approaching nearly 4,000. This is about 20% less than that. So if that's where the number is finalized, that's a small bit of good news. On the tech side, we hear big tech companies laying off a significant portion of workers. We used to hear that there was a war for tech talent in the banking industry. How much are you seeing the banking uh, uh, vortex bring in some of the tech staff that's being laid off? We certainly saw a lot of that over the last few years, but let's look at the cuts that are taking place this week at Goldman Sachs. All the conversations we've had with our sources across <clears> the firm <throat> indicate that a number of those hits will be affecting people who are working on the tech side, on the engineering side, because that's where you've seen a lot of headcount growth. Interesting. You can't just build a digital bank for the future without ramping up aggressively there. You can't roll out a lot of these new products without staffing up on that front. And that's a place which is ripe for cuts, unfortunately. One question before we let you go. Is everybody back in their seats in the office? Is it being in person really important? Well, over the last two years, one theme has been very clear. If there is one bank that has been adamant about wanting everyone back in the office, Goldman Sachs has been at the forefront of it. Heading into Have they top... lost people because of that? Come on, you talk to everybody. One would hope not. We'll find out at the end of the week. But surely, I cannot expect that being a factor in cutting jobs. But to Lisa's No, question, but are there tech guys at Goldman Sachs having a tantrum because they got to darken the door five days a week? Cut to the chase. They might have been throwing tantrums, and we certainly heard a lot of complaints out, out of 200 West over the last couple of years. But right now, they don't have a vent for those complaints. Right now, they want to keep their heads down and hope that they still have a job going into next week. I mean, week. you're only working here. You, you, you're working four days a week at home, right? I count five days a week in the office, Tom. Really? Of course he does. Basic doesn't do that. <laughs> You know. Yes, she does. Everyone works very hard here. Look, I don't think that necessarily being in well, the office also <clears throat> indicates how hard people work, but there is a shift back to a culture of being more in person, don't particularly for the banking industry. I need the surveillance industry. cork on this. i got to be careful. Anyway, Sri Natarajan uh, with us here. We do this into January, into earnings of banks. He will be most busy on the movements on global Wall Street here uh, through the coming days as well. It is a different January in New York City, I it would is. say that. Between I, two strikes by nurses and the turmoil on Wall Street, it's just a different—we're you know, it's we're post the pandemic, I get it, but 
wow, is it a different January? I feel like this is the first year that we have a sense of what the post-pandemic reality yes, might look like. strongly agree. Right now. Right, right now. now. Yeah. And that last year was still recovering from the pandemic. This year is <clears throat> different. This year is, okay, reset. People get back yeah. to the offices however many days a week that they are agreeing to do so and face something that's going to be a very mixed picture economically. That's good. Well, economically, but also politically, I, I would suggest that, you know, with all the school trauma and that, maybe we get to some normal Normality that we have not had, and well, that would be right now. But we'll pay, we'll pay attention to this in our local people, of course, with those nurse strikes. That's a big deal for New York City. Yeah, especially because we are heading into the trifecta of various illnesses. It's not over, despite the fact that people are ignoring it. I do want to mention Lululemon shares. A toxic brew of um, illnesses? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, it is. I mean, it's a disaster. And people don't seem to care anymore. It's just sort of like, yeah, you're sick, right. you're something, you know. I honestly, oh, look at that. Uh, there is this coming. Uh, Morgan Stanley's John Pruzan. A one-time CEO oh. candidate, <clears throat> exit the firm. That is a big deal through the morning for Global Wall Street. He is the chief financial officer of Morgan Stanley. There are three, if not four, people under Mr. Gorman. And everybody, including Mr. Gorman, is a young Turk. This is really, really interesting to see. A 28-year advisor to uh, James Gorman exiting yeah. the firm. John Prusen, to lead Morgan Stanley. Stay with Bloomberg. Good morning.